Good afternoon. Let me welcome you to this workshop on Vehicle Technologies for Connected, Cooperative and Automated Mobility, or CCAM for short. My name is David Storer. I'm the Director of Research, Innovation and New Mobility at CLEPA, the European Association of Automotive Suppliers. This workshop has been organised within the context of the EU project Arcade by CLEPA, partners in the Arcade project involved in international cooperation, and with the support of Ethicon, the Arcade Project Coordinator, and VDI VDE IT. Let's go to the next slide, please. Although I think that by now we're all very familiar with the netiquette rules for online workshops such as this, please let me just remind you to make sure that your microphone is always muted, unless, of course, you intend to speak. Um, also, please feel free to use the chat uh, to share comments or questions you may have. Although due to a packed agenda, there'll be relatively little time to field questions during the sessions themselves, we are hoping that the chat can act as a forum for discussion between participants. I should also mention that the workshop is being recorded so that colleagues unable to attend this afternoon can catch up at a later date. So again, for those of you who have just joined, welcome. I'm David Storer, the RNI Director of CLEPA and lead of Cluster 2 Vehicle Technologies of the CCAM Partnership. For anyone unfamiliar with the CCAM Partnership, its recently elected chairman, Armin Greiter, will provide relevant information shortly during the opening session. However, before starting the opening session, let's just take a quick look together at today's program. So following the opening session, uh, we will have a keynote presentation on the LT pilot project by Arya Etimad, the coordinator of the project. This is a key project, obviously looking at L3 automation. And this is very relevant because the CCAM partnership is addressing the next level of automation, so L4 automation. Let's go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, so following um, that keynote presentation, we will start with the technical session, the first technical session, focusing on uh, key technologies for CCAM, in particular, environment perception, data diffusion, decision making, and artificial intelligence. This session will be moderated by Gary Meyer of VDIVDEIT. Uh, Gary has been uh, very active in all the different stages of the setting of the CCAM partnership. Uh, and it will also be moderated by Margaret van Schindel from the TU Eindhoven. Margaret is the um, leader of Cluster 5 in the CCAM partnership. Let's go to the next slide, please. So following that first technical session, we will have a second keynote address uh, by SAE International on standards uh, for connected and automated vehicles presented by Ed Straub, who is the Director of the Office of Automation at SAE International. And then we will, after that, go into the next uh, second technical session, uh, focusing on, let's say, user-centric aspects, uh, safety, HMI, human factors, life on board, inclusiveness. And that will be moderated by myself, together with Peter Urban of the IKA Institute uh, in Aachen, uh, Peter is leader of cluster three in the CCAM par uh, partnership. Okay, so that gives you an overview of the program. We intend to finish at 5.30, at 17.30. Um, so let me now welcome the speakers of the first session and pass to Stefan Dreyer of Ethical, the Ar Arcade Coordinator, and leader of CCAM cluster seven, addressing coordination, who will act as the moderator of this session. Thank you. Over to you, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. OK, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon from my side and welcome to this workshop on vehicle technologies for CCAM on behalf of the Arcade Project Consortium. Uh, I'm Stefan Dreher. I'm Senior Manager Innovation and Deployment at Ertico ITS Europe. I'm also coordinating the Arcade Coordination and Support Action. And I will have the pleasure of moderating this opening session. 
So in this uh, introductory session, uh, we will set the scene with an introduction to the funded uh, research and innovation and as well the strategy context on CCAM in Europe with uh, uh, first uh, the first Horizon Europe calls, but as well an overview of the CCAM partnership and of uh, support actions Arcade and as well the Cosmos project. Uh, due to the tight schedule, uh, we will not have uh, questions and answers between the different uh, presentations, but depending on the time we have left at the end, we might be able to take one or two uh, questions. Um, with that, let's start with the first presentation. So our first speaker today will be Lutke Rogge uh, from the European Commission. So Lutke is policy officer at the European Commission, the Directorate General Research and Innovation in the Future Urban and Mobility Systems. So Lutke, the floor is yours. Okay. I don't know if there's a problem with the sound. I just we cannot hear you, Lutke, if you're trying to speak. Yeah, indeed, I don't see Lutke in the presenters, but he just sent me a message that he's connected. So maybe there's a problem with the with the connection. Okay, then maybe while we were while we are waiting to sort the issue for for Lutka, we can go on to the to my own presentation, which was supposed to to be just after Lutka's introduction. Maybe I can skip the three slides. Mm. Yes, thank you. Okay, then let, let's start by giving first a quick introduction to the Arcade project, which has been organizing this, this workshop. Um, and as well, I would like to illustrate here a bit how the results of this workshop will be used and exploited. So Arcade is an European funded coordination and support action focusing on supporting the coordination of research and innovation in CCAM in Europe. The project consists of three main pillars. Uh, the one on the top here being the network. So we are federating a large network of experts organizing workshops like this event today or other events like the UCAT conference, which we co-organized with the European Commission in April earlier this year. In the past, we structured our work according to thematic areas that correspond to challenges in CCAM. But now these areas are being aligned with the seven clusters of the CCAM partnership. Uh, which will be uh, introduced as well by our next speaker. Uh, finally, all the knowledge we uh, we generate is being uh, uh, fed into a knowledge base, which, uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide. So the knowledge base, which is available free online. And this knowledge base is uh, meant to be a one-stop shop for all the CCAM related activities in Europe and beyond. It contains an overview of European funded project and national research and innovation projects, an overview of regulations and policies, strategies, and roadmap. Uh, can we maybe go to the slide before? Yeah. No, before? Okay, there's one slide missing. <laughs> Okay, there was a slide supposed to show here the, the European the knowledge base and as well the the map that we that we are will publish soon. So the uh, as I said, the knowledge base contains an overview of research and innovation projects, uh, an overview of regulation policies, strategies and roadmaps, as well standards and evaluation methodologies and data sharing uh, framework. Very soon, it will also feature an interactive map with the location of all the testing and piloting initiatives across Europe. Uh, distinguishing between public road trials, corridors, test trucks, and simulators. It will be possible to see what is being tested where in Europe. Right. 
So stay tuned as this will be released soon on the knowledge base on the connected automated driving.eu website. On the next slide, um, so the workshop today is in the continuity of a series of workshops that Arcade has been organizing since last year, in particular to support the working group two uh, of the CCAM platform to improve the exchange of knowledge and experiences and as well look into common approaches. These workshops are also meant to support the CCAM partnership uh, in the identification of future research and innovation priorities as part of the development of the strategic research and innovation agenda and as well its future updates. So I'm glad that in this workshop today we have uh, we are cooperating with the leaders of the different CCAM clusters focusing on technologies. Uh, so first the cluster two on vehicle technology, uh, cluster three on validation, cluster five on key enabling technologies and as well cluster seven on coordination. So that's all with my own presentation. Uh, I don't know if in the meantime, Ludger has been able to join again or if we can hear him. Well, uh, Lucas seems to have connection problems. Um, it's very difficult for him to be able to speak at the moment. So let's please proceed, Stefan. Perhaps going to Armin's presentation. Yes. Do we have Armin on the line? If Armin is not able to speak, perhaps I can go through the slides of Armin just to make sure that uh, we don't fall too behind here. Yeah, please, um, that would be good. Thanks. Yeah, so again, this is David. Uh, the CCAM partnership has been set up really with the vision of uh, establishing European leadership in safe and sustainable road transport through automation. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so yeah, there are different aspects to make this uh, partnership successful, but there is a real focus uh, on the user needs and the societal aspects of mobility. Um, you know, there's a realization that in order to make a connected, cooperative, automated mobility a reality, there needs to be real buy-in from the user perspective there needs to be acceptance from from the public it's uh, very important that social aspects of mobility are addressed please go back a slide um but part of this obviously the, um, one of the main aspects is to develop the key enabling technologies for the partnership uh, for for ccam um, and if we look at the graphic there on the right hand side we see the different areas indicated with the numbers one to seven these indicate the different clusters uh, of the CCAM partnership so cluster one is large-scale demonstrations cluster two vehicle technologies which is the main focus of the workshop today cluster three on safety and validation cluster four on the very important aspect of integrating the vehicle into the transport system cluster five on key enabling technologies here there's obviously a very direct link with cluster two on vehicle technologies um, and both let's say are addressed in today's workshop and then cluster six societal aspects and user needs and cluster seven on coordination so what the partnership intends to focus on is the development of the different key technologies and to demonstrate them and validate um, the technology in real life operation next, next slide please So in order to achieve the vision, uh, a series of different objectives have been defined, looking at also what the societal impact of these objectives will be. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, 
but there is a lot of detail in the Shreya document. The Shreya document is a strategic research and innovation agenda of the Sinkan partnership, and this is due to be published in its final version very soon. So please look out for that document and uh, you know, look at the, the specific objectives uh, and general objectives that have been defined there. If we go to the next slide, please. We have also defined within the partnership a series of operational objectives. These are, in very concrete terms, what the partnership aims to achieve in the different, uh, over the different timescale. So the timescale we're talking about is up to 2030, and at different times, different milestones, uh, specific objectives, as we see here, aim to be achieved. Can we go to the next slide, please? So in detail, um, the strategic research and innovation agenda uh, covers, as I said, lots of different aspects, but divided into these different clusters that we mentioned before. Um, and cluster one, probably, let's say, the most important cluster is developing the living labs and the pilot project. So really looking at the implementation of the, uh, of the technology in real life. If we go quickly to the next slide as well. Cluster two in this uh, picture is a key enabler. And cluster two, the development of the key technologies on the vehicle is the topic of today's workshop. And we can see there how we've basically broken down the areas of research and innovation into five main areas within this cluster. Uh, the first area is environment perception technology for CCAM. Second is safe and reliable onboard decision-making technologies. The third is preventive and protective safety for highly automated vehicles. And then we have specific areas looking at HMI and looking at user-centric development for CCAM. So in a nutshell, this is what the CCAM partnership is aiming to achieve. And um, so far, it's been being launched very successfully. And there are over 150 partners already uh, subscribing to this partnership. So it really is a, a good uh, collection of all the interested stakeholders that are coming together to address this really um, difficult, complex and integrated uh, topic together uh, within this initiative. So um, with that, I will hand over back to you, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you, David, for, for taking over this presentation and as well for introducing the general objectives of the of the partnership. So I, I, I guess that beyond research, there are other challenges still remaining, in particular regarding also regulations and policies and so on. So on. And, and the and we know that the partnership will not deal directly with it, but there will be, of course, uh, uh, cooperation on these with, with organizations and as well through the research and innovation actions. Um, then I think that the problem with look is still being solved. So then I would suggest that we go then to the next presentation, which uh, will be done by by Benjamin um, Wilsch. So um, Benjamin uh, is a consultant at the Department Mobility, Energy and Future Technologies at VDI VD IT. He's coordinator of the European funded Cosmos project supporting the Excel Lighthouse Initiative Mobility E, and he will present today these initiatives. So, uh, Benjamin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah, and thank you again also for the invitation, the opportunity to present the Mobility E Lighthouse here today. Um, as Stefan has said, I am the coordinator of the Cosmos project, which like Arcade is a um, coordination and support action. Um, it is funded by the Excel joint undertaking, which has also launched the Mobility E Lighthouse as one of three lighthouses to signpost um, topics of common European interest. The other two are concerned with health and industry 4.0. And of course, the Mobility e Lighthouse focuses on mobility. Um, the Lighthouse strives to be a networking and collaboration platform for the mobility ecosystem, 
and to strengthen that ecosystem to um, tackle and cope with all the challenges associated with the introduction of electric connected and automated mobility. Next slide, please. So I just want to uh, provide a little bit of background um, for the motivation of the Lighthouse. Why was such a networking and collaboration platform launched initially? Um, if we look at the traditional automotive sector and the value chain, as I think we all know it, um, starting from the electronic components and systems side here at the bottom, and then reaching all the way up to the application side, to which, of course, the, the CCAM partnership is also much closer. Um, all the stakeholders along this value chain need to be connected and to um, exchange ideas um, to accelerate progress towards electric connected and automated mobility. Um, and that was the original motivation of the, um, introdu for the introduction of the Mobility e Lighthouse. If we go to the next slide, please, we can see that um, uh, shown here um, is again the ECS side, the components and system side of the value chain at the bottom, and then grouped at the top, the application side. We can see that the introduction of electrification um, and automation um, opens the pathway for new applications on the one hand side, which also then go beyond uh, classical automotive applications. And there are also, on the other hand, um, of course, new components, for example, for cybersecurity that are being developed and introduced. And between these two sides of the value chain, we can then have several push and pull effects. Um, for example, in development of a new component that allows the introduction of a new application. And this, of course, the challenges that are associated with the introduction of such new applications are not purely technical, but they're also non-technical factors to be taken into account, as you can see at the top of the diagram here um, in the area of um, economics, legal factors, human factors, or societal factors. Um, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. In fact, same slide with an animation. This is where the Mobility Lighthouse comes in to connect all the technical stakeholders, but also beyond the automotive value chain, um, non-technical stakeholders, um, and to work towards a vision of um, introducing electric connected and automated mobility solutions as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Um, looking at the objectives of the Lighthouse, then um, a, a key objective is also to strengthen European competitiveness, to keep the EU at the forefront of global competition, to address societal challenges, and as I've already explained, um, to build links between the traditional automotive sector and the ECS community. Um, on the right-hand side, the sum of the actions that the Cosmos project for, has uh, conducted over the past two and a half years for the Mobility e Lighthouse. Um, and those include events for cross-sector collaboration and networking, but also um, a elicitation of research priorities to the field. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so how does the Mobility Lighthouse um, achieve this or try to achieve this? Um, on one hand side, it connects stakeholders all along the mobility value chain. Um, and as you can see in the diagram at the, on the top right here, um, there is a Lighthouse Initiative Advisory Service, a LIAS, where research organizations, automotive suppliers, um, semiconductors, provi semiconductor providers, um, but also mobility related associations and PPPs um, come together regularly to discuss, um, for example, again, research priorities. On another layer, um, it connects projects and you can see certain projects that are currently, uh, back to the previous slide, please, briefly, because that's at the bottom here. Um, the 13 projects that are currently part of the Mobility e Lighthouse, and those are both include both projects funded by the XLJU, but also funded under Horizon 2020. So to establish a link between these projects and also projects that are still currently running and those that have already been completed and that can share best practices. Next slide, please. Um, actually, I would like to skip this slide looking at the time and move. On to the next one. 
here's just a list of networking events that maybe some of you have already attended in the past years. Of course, in the last year, we also had to switch to a virtual format, um, but these are very important events for the Mobility Lighthouse, of course, to bring these stakeholders together and to have workshops, again, um, on research priorities, on topic prioritization, or on the derivation of actions to accelerate progress. Um, so very central instrument for the Mobility Lighthouse. And then we can go to the next slide, or perhaps also uh, one further. Seeing that the session is almost coming to an end, I can. I would just like to point you to where you can find more information all about the Mobility Lighthouse. Um, first, of course, the website, mobilite.eu. There you can find um, reports of the past events, um, reports of some project results, um, and also currently a survey on the prioritization of research topics. So if you go on that website, click on the news section, you will find a link to that online consultation. And we, of course, um, would be glad to have um, many participants fill out that form and help us validate those research priorities. And then if you would like to hear more about the Mobility E Lighthouse, there is a, an opportunity tomorrow. We have an event starting at 10 a.m. Um, you can see the agenda here, but you can also find more details on that event and the registration link, um, again, on, in the new section of the website. So thank you for now. And um, yeah, please join us tomorrow at the Mobility e virtual Symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin, for this overview of, uh, of the Cosmos project and the e -Li Mobility Lighthouse uh, initiative. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, we don't have much time and we are a bit behind schedule. Uh, in the meantime, we have been able to solve the, the issue. So, uh, so Lutker will be replaced by Tom Alkim, who kindly joined us um, and will present the slides from, from Lutker. So Tom Alkim is also policy officer of automated driving at the European Commission at the Directorate General for Research and Innovation. Uh, so thank you, Tom. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Stefan. I guess there were some problems with, uh, with GoToMeeting. So uh, now I am the, the go-to guy. I'll try to uh, see what Lutker was uh, uh, wanting to uh, present uh, to you. You can go to the next slide, uh, uh, please. And uh, of course, uh, thanks for the invitation for this, uh, this workshop. Um, um, thank you, Klepa. Thank you, Arcade, for organizing. Um, of course, these kind of workshops are usually also very good for networking, although the networking um, digitally is, uh, is a bit more tricky than uh, physically. Hopefully after summer we can uh, go back uh, to that. But uh, still uh, we think that this workshop is an excellent opportunity to get a good understanding of the ongoing R&I activities in the area of uh, vehicle technologies uh, for CCAM in Europe and worldwide and the uh, associated R&I challenges. So as stated in the Smart and Sustainable Mobility Strategy of the European Commission, uh, published uh, a few months ago. Um, we want to achieve a wide deployment of automated mobility systems by 2030. And of course, uh, they will only yield uh, effects, uh, positive effects, if it is done correctly. And um, in order to do that, we still have to overcome a number of technical uh, challenges uh, before we can uh, see this uh, uh, on the road. Uh, but also non-technical uh, challenges. And uh, you can see here on the, on the slide that it goes beyond uh, technology, uh, especially the societal aspects and user needs will be very important in the, in the future. Um, let me say a few words on the, on the partnership where I will be short because uh, Armin will uh, uh, come next and he will tell you more about uh, the partnership, but we are looking forward uh, to that. Uh, we have fully supported setting up uh, this uh, partnership and it will help to uh, pool all the resources and to better align RNI efforts in the area of, uh, of CCAM, both from the public and from the, from the private side. And in the recent months, uh, the partnership has developed the first long-term RNI agenda for Europe. Um, I'm happy that it is uh, about to be uh, uh, implemented and uh, it will help to, uh, uh, to reach, um, uh, hopefully, this uh, large-scale deployment by 2030. 
It will be officially launched on uh, June 23rd, so that's next week during the RNI days, where the uh, Memorandum of Understanding of uh, in total 11 co program partnerships, including the CCAM partnership, will be uh, signed. And the first partnership board meeting will be held on July 7th. And the first calls for proposals, uh, I read here that they have uh, been uh, published uh, today. So that is uh, good news. Of course, we have seen them uh, uh, before, um, but they, uh, they are published today. This new research uh, agenda um, also defined a roadmap for seven RNI areas or clusters that you can see here on the, on the slide. Um, but the RNI agenda of the partnership does not only address technology challenges, uh, as, as mentioned before, it looks at the societal aspects, user needs, validation, uh, physical and digital infrastructure or connectivity to support CCAM. All these elements are necessary to do it right. Uh, the new agenda will pay particular attention to large scale demonstration projects. Uh, you could say that this is uh, uh, the heart of the uh, agenda. That's also why it is in the middle of, uh, of the picture that you see on the, on the right. Because there it can all be uh, uh, tested in practice. And um, while doing that, we can learn a lot uh, from practice. Um, that's where it needs to happen. And um, we can, uh, in iterative steps, um, try to um, uh, improve uh, things. Um, if in practice, uh, things uh, will turn out uh, not as expected, which uh, quite often happens. And through these uh, multiple large-scale demos, we should uh, uh, improve uh, step by step. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, yeah. So here you see yesterday uh, uh, the, the first calls uh, uh, were published in, in Horizon Europe. And these goals uh, will include new funding opportunities uh, for uh, research in research in the area of CCAM. Uh, there will be two calls with in total 11 topics. And the first call opens, um, uh, well, June 16th, that's, uh, that's today. And the call deadline is uh, uh, October 19th. That's uh, at the end of uh, ITS World Con Conference. And the second call uh, already opens uh, at the beginning of uh, the ITS World Conference with a deadline in January 12th. So it will be a quite busy uh, second half uh, of, uh, of this year, where uh, basically all the RNI areas of the, um, uh, of, of the SIGM partnership are covered in, uh, in these uh, two calls. Four out of the 11 topics deal with the research on in-vehicle technologies or uh, key enabling technologies. So there is still quite a lot on technology, but it is uh, complemented with a lot of the other factors. You can go now to the next slide. So uh, this is also the, the last slide. Uh, we try to keep it short. Uh, let me finish by highlighting the importance of international cooperation. Uh, we want to strengthen links with partners from other regions uh, of the world. Uh, we are convinced that international cooperation can be very useful to uh, exchange knowledge and experience. Uh, in particular, we think that uh, partners from the US, Japan, Canada, South Korea, Singapore and Australia would, uh, would qualify for that. And some of the, um, well, the reasons for cooperation is, of course, to share experience, knowledge and data collected in various projects and large scale demonstrations in particular. Also identify common research areas and fields of cooperation to exploit synergies. And in the longer term, uh, this cooperation can lead to uh, harmonized approaches in terms of uh, testing methodologies and standards. So uh, with this, I have come to the end of this uh, presentation. Um, I hope we have a very fruitful and interesting workshop and I look forward to the uh, other presentations. And hopefully Armin has solved his uh, tech challenges uh, as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, uh, for this overview of the RNI agenda and this for CCAM and the Horizon Europe context and the new calls. Um, so you, yeah, you mentioned that Amin actually was replaced by by David for the presentation before. So I mean, solve these issues in the meantime. But as the presentation was already done, I would suggest that we 
go on directly with the with the next presentations. Uh, I would just wanted to mention that it's I'm I'm glad you mentioned indeed the the aspects of international cooperation for CCAM as well. So because we would like as well in this workshop to to address that. Uh, in, in order to see what are the, the needs for international cooperation in the different uh, areas. And we have, as we have today as well, many presentations uh, from uh, industry actors that are active uh, also at international level. I think it's, uh, it's something that we can bring here as well for the future uh, needs and uh, the CCAM partnership. So with that, uh, for a question of time, I would like to go directly to our next speaker, which is the uh, which is uh, a keynote presentation by by Arya Etemat uh, on uh, the L3 pilot project. So Arya Etemat is senior project manager, automated driving at uh, Volkswagen Group Research, and he's coordinator of the EU research project L3 pilot. So Arya, the floor is yours. Aria, we can't hear you. Yeah, I see you are muted, so I think you have to unmute yourself. Aria, can you? Either unmute, unmute yourself yes. or can somebody unmute? I was not able to do so, but I hope okay. uh, you can now hear me and yes. hopefully see the screen. I don't know if the right screen is presented to you. Yes, we can see everything in the slide. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, um, uh, Stefan, for the introduction. And uh, thank you to both of you, David and Stefan, for having me here. and. Uh, asking L3 pilots for this um, important presentation. Indeed, there are several activities ongoing in Europe. L3 pilot is one of them. At the same time, a major activity for vehicle manufacturers in Europe. And I will show you a few slides uh, about that. L3 pilot is, as the project name says, about level three automation, but the piloting of that, not the development really. And um, we have decided to test on uh, uh, public roads in Europe that uh, brings us to uh, some difficulties that we have been and uh, challenges that we have been facing. But maybe first um, a bit about um, the history of L3 Pilot. This is not a project that was uh, um, just prepared uh, without any background. So the background of L3 Pilot has started in 2008 with Euro FOT. Uh, Euro FOT was the first European large scale project um, on advanced driver assistance systems. Uh, we have to move forward with uh, many vehicle manufacturers and uh, academic partners in order to develop automated driving systems in the adaptive project and uh, um, preparing some building blocks for the L3 pilot project. Uh, one of them I will explain in more details um, after that. So L3 pilot is uh, using the whole background, uh, bringing uh, our ideas also to the road. Um, in a nutshell, L3 pilot um, has planned to have 1000 uh, participants, uh, subjects, uh, drivers, uh, uh, in our vehicles, uh, 100 vehicles in total in 10 different countries. Of course, the COVID-19 uh, has uh, been playing a role, hitting us uh, also in the middle of our piloting phase. But uh, I'm happy to say that we fulfilled uh, at least 80%, uh, sometimes more of uh, what we had on the list at the beginning. And it was 2016, the planning for this uh, large, large scale project. Those topics of uh, L3 pilots are um, uh, dealing with uh, three uh, ODDs, uh, operational design domains. Uh, one of them is the motorway. Uh, the left two applications are um, for motorways. So the traffic jam uh, for speeds up to uh, 60 kilometers per hour and the motorway application uh, for uh, speeds up to 130 kilometers. 
So other activities uh, like, like parking applications and urban uh, applications and driving have been also uh, checked in this uh, project and um, yeah, we have collected a, a, a big amount of data at the moment we are evaluating them um, uh, preparing the final results soon uh, that was the original plan having um, uh, many uh, partners driving in different countries in europe but also the cross-border activities. At the beginning, we had a big number of cross-border activities, uh, but we face reality soon uh, that it is very difficult to drive uh, one from one country to the other in Europe, uh, having not the permission in other countries. You usually have the permission for your home-based country, but it's uh, we faced um, some big uh, challenges for receiving them in another country. And this is one of the hopes for the follow-up project in order to create a code of practice for road testing in Europe. This is harmonized. And if you have uh, the approval for your vehicle in one country, you can drive with that and test with that in other countries. The project has uh, 34 partners in total. And this is the first one uh, with uh, the involvement of so many vehicle manufacturers in Europe. So uh, 13 vehicle manufacturers are involved in this project. Uh, there are some more maybe indirectly, but um, you know, this is underlining the complexity of this project. And this is uh, also the first one I said, uh, we have so many vehicle manufacturers. Uh, but beside that, that uh, we have suppliers, we have the insurance companies. As you can see, we have a number of um, authorities and uh, uh, research organization, FIA, and others supporting us. Uh, and this is, again, those uh, different topics in the project that we need to deal with. The project um, is uh, in the sense of uh, complexity large and also the budget. We have almost a budget of 70 million euros. And there are, besides the management and innovation activities that are not displayed here, six different topics, uh, major topics in the project. And I'm going to take you through a few of them today, just uh, spending a bit of time on that. The first one is uh, the so-called code of practice. The code of practice is uh, uh, an approach that is well known in other industries, but in the automotive industry, we have started with that uh, um, uh, early 2000 uh, with the code of practice for advanced driver assistance systems. That was published in 2008 uh, as a result of response three projects as a part of a prevent project at that time. So uh, we have used that uh, as a base and even with uh, some experts that have been putting together the code of practice for ADAS, preparing the legal aspects for automated driving in the adaptive project. And it took us uh, some time, and I, I recall that uh, there were 14 different legal departments involved in the discussion preparing um, the legal aspects. We have used all those results from the adaptive project and have started in 2017 preparing the code of practice for automated driving. This is important for us to have a, a big number of OEMs and their buy-ins in order to create a code of practice that is a kind of cookbook, if you want, for developing the automated driving functions. Uh, I'm happy and proud to say that uh, by October this year, we will uh, publish the code of practice for automated driving uh, as one of the results of the L3 pilot project uh, during the ITS Board Congress. The next topic I would like to have a look at is uh, about data. Data ha has been, uh, is, is the key for the development of automated uh, functions and, uh, and uh, there are uh, also very complex approaches about the data. Uh, we have been drawing this picture in order to make sure that everybody understands what is um, the data, where is the data coming, what level of uh, information is uh, uh, involved, included in each database that uh, we, we are using in the project. At the end, it turned out that this is a very useful picture for our legal departments in order to discuss at which level other partners may look at the data because as you know there are sensitivities about the data especially in the automotive industry all those um, 
intellectual property rights and GDPR issues are involved there and uh, we needed just a long time, I'm talking about years, to have an agreement who is accessing which part of the data in this project. So uh, at the end of the day, the uh, database number four, which is called open data, is aggregation of the data that is uh, collected in the project. And uh, we will publish that at the end of the project uh, as one of the results of the L3 pilot project. This is not the only database we will publish. Uh, we have published already some other databases. Uh, this is the OpenDD database is one of them. This is about uh, uh, roundabout uh, uh, drone data sets. Uh, we have used drones and collected data um, for uh, uh, checking the behavior of traffic participants in a roundabout in several ones uh, in Germany. And um, uh, what you can see is uh, on the left hand side is the result. So at the end of the day, the database contains um, just boxes. These are vehicles that are moving and lines. This is then the trace of those uh, vehicles. So that will help us also to understand how an automated driving function need to be uh, programmed in order to manage uh, um, driving in roundabout and out of roundabout. Um, the, the other approach is to have drones uh, uh, for um, checking the traffic on highways, just classifying the, um, uh, the traffic and the vehicles there, their speeds, their behavior, lane changing, for example, and so on. And this is uh, another approach to understand uh, what kind of scenarios we may face if we prepare an automated driving uh, function. The next one is about piloting. Piloting is, has started uh, more or less beginning of last year after a uh, ramp up phase. And uh, we started very carefully, of course. Uh, we had uh, first safety drivers sitting on the driver's seat uh, with the special training uh, because uh, as I said, we uh, didn't want to test on the test tracks only, but on uh, public roads. And therefore, it was necessary to take um, uh, safety measures as, uh, uh, as many as possible. So uh, that was uh, one of the topics we had on our list for the technical uh, preparation of the project. What we had not on the list uh, is, as you can see, for example, this plastic sheet separating uh, the participants in the project from the safety driver uh, because of the COVID-19. So we had uh, many other topics to cover in order to be able to run our tests, uh, uh, even though uh, COVID was in place and was hitting us, of course, uh, uh, for months, not being able to drive there. At the end of the day, uh, our partners have managed to drive and collect uh, several hundred thousand of kilometers of data. And um, uh, we have uh, collected tons of data and they have been uh, put in a harmonized database. Um, the structure and the content of the database and how the harmonization could uh, work uh, has been published already on, on GitHub. And this is also one of the results of, of the project. Another topic I would like to um, address is uh, a survey that we have uh, uh, prepared, and this is the first time that we have taken an approach. But uh, I wanted to show uh, just uh, that uh, there was a clear commitment, and I have taken this picture as an example. This is a sub part of, of one of our sub projects. But uh, and as a good example that how people have been working together, uh, they were committed to deliver, working together to uh, prepare results for the projects, even though um, the uh, pandemic uh, effects uh, were in place and we couldn't meet, meet in person. So it's just a big thank to not only this team, but to the whole team uh, of L3 Pilot for the preparation. Coming back to the survey, we have, uh, planned at the beginning of the project to have three uh, surveys. So a kind of long-term um, study and longitudinal study because the same survey has been in place uh, every year in total three years uh, um, in a row and uh, three times. Uh, at the moment, the number of 18,000 has been increased with uh, an additional study uh, by BTT in Finland to 37,000 respondents for 
um, for our questions. And this will be also uh, as a database be published and the results will be available during the final event. So I have several times mentioned the final event. This will take place in Hamburg uh, back to back with the uh, ITS World Congress or to be more accurate uh, within the ITS uh, World Congress uh, uh, in Hamburg. Uh, the final event uh, as such with all presentations and presentation of results will be in place uh, for and is planned for uh, October 13th and 14th. And uh, but the whole exhibition and the driving demonstrations uh, will be in place from uh, the Monday to Friday uh, during the ITS World Congress. L3 Pilot will be then the largest uh, exhibitor of the ITS. Uh, we will be there with 23 vehicles and providing dynamic demonstrations. So this is the part of L3 Pilot, very fast, and I promise just uh, maybe two minutes of two slides. Uh, I have been talking about uh, some challenges we have been facing uh, and we have decided to have a follow-up project on L3 Pilot. I'm happy that the European Commission has approved that project. The kickoff meeting is uh, for July 7th. This will be also a large project with 44 partners and uh, many interesting topics on the list, uh, complexity even higher than L3 Pilot. Uh, very short, the project will uh, address the fragmentation of uh, ODDs, so those uh, giving uh, control back from the system to the uh, driver and so on, in order to um, uh, make uh, automated driving uh, more harmonized and uh, uh, more interesting and valuable. So uh, we will do that, and this is again a, a short description of what, what is on plan, and the credit for this picture goes to Tom, um, this is uh, taken from one of his presentations and uh, it is uh, if you want to have uh, um, an uh, non-interrupted automated driving and this is the first uh, uh, picture you see interruptions in red then you need to address them by enabling so-called enabling technologies and this is what we thought at the beginning of the project and during the preparation that we could address those issues by using for example uh, communication technologies and big data, uh, machine learning, and so on. And this is the goal for uh, the High Drive project as a follow-up of uh, L3 project. Thank you very much, and this is all from my side. Stefan? Are you there, Stefan? I think he has the same issue. He cannot uh, unmute himself. Ex exactly. I don't know what's happening. I, I was trying to <laughs> mute it, it was not, not allowed. Good. <laughs> now it's working. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Arya, for, for this uh, overview of, of LT Pilot and uh, follow up project High Drive. Uh, and uh, thank you as well for, for making it. Uh, a short and efficient presentation uh, because we have just one minute i don't see any specific question from the audience but i wanted to quickly ask uh, about the international uh, cooperation so looking at the scale of entry pilot and as well the ambition now with high drive i guess you have some areas in which you you, you had or you plan to have international cooperation you have some details about that no okay now we cannot hear you anymore. Oh, sorry. Now, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. It's okay. It was a bit of um, international cooperation within L3 Pilot. Um, I mentioned uh, the code of practice. Of course, for us, it was interesting to see uh, what other people in other regions, other experts of other regions are thinking about that. We have been really uh, requesting also feedback, written feedback from others. Um, this, the situation will change a lot, uh, not only for the code of practice that we will de de further develop in, in high drive project, but uh, for uh, many other topics. We already have started uh, 
discussion with the U.S. Department of Transportation, uh, with um, uh, with the Japanese groups um, and uh, uh, groups in Singapore, in, in order to see how we could run um, and cooperate uh, together uh, for the high drive project, and that will uh, start there. So we will have a huge platform there. For example, working also with the road operators and authorities there. Uh, this will be a much much. Uh, uh, larger uh, effort uh, in place for Hydra. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, that's good to know. And yeah, looking forward to the final event, uh, the IGS Congress and uh, the continuation. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I see now that it's written break, but I don't know if we have time for a break or should we go directly to the technical sessions? Let's have a two minute break, but literally two minute break and then we can go directly to technical session now. Okay, great. So I would like to apologize again quickly for the for this uh, a bit uh, rushed session and uh, due to technical difficulties, but I think we, we got back on track now. And I would like to thank all the speakers of this uh, opening session. Thank you very much for these very interesting presentations. And for that, uh, I would like to hand over to uh, to Geren Meyer and uh, Margit van Skindel for the technical session just after the break. Thank you very much to all. Thanks. Thank you. So let's be back again in two minutes and we'll start technical session. Thank you. All right, so we continue at um, half past two then. Okay, so that was a, a quite a short break. Um, with this, I'm welcoming you to the first technical session of the Vehicle Technologies for Connected Cooperative Automated Mobility Workshop. Um, my name is Garen Meyer. I'm heading the European International Business Development Department here at VDI VDEIT in Berlin. And I'm also the delegate of the European Technology Platform EPOS and the CCAM Partnership. And I'm doing uh, the moderation together with uh, Marit von Scheindl, uh, who is the program director for smart mobility at the Technik University in Eindhoven. Hello, Marit. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Gary. Yeah, hello, great you're here. Um, we'll be looking into the state of the art and future perspectives of technologies that enable yeah, environment perception, data fusion, decision making, artificial intelligence, it's essential for making connected and automated driving possible. And as the speakers in the session that represent key players in the automotive value chain will explain in much detail, I think um, we will see to what extent um, these technologies are or are not yet mature 
for enabling yeah, level four automation the way that Arya Itamat described it uh, just a minute ago. Uh, so in an uninterrupted or an interrupted way um, of the operational design domains. And uh, uh, that, that, is, that is essential uh, for um, understanding what still needs to be done in the context of the CCAM partnership or also in the key digital technologies partnership uh, that uh, uh, Benjamin Wilsch introduced in his presentation. Um, so, uh, yeah, Marit, um, over to you to explain a little bit what we have planned. Well, I, I'll stay to stick to a brief explanation because we have a quite quite a tight schedule. We have one and a half hours or close to that with seven speakers with totally different types of topics that we touch upon as you already introduced in, in this first part. So we have a very short introduction and we have about eight, ten minutes per speaker. And then please already put your questions to the panelists in the panel in the chat box. We can see them on the background and we take them with us to the discussion later on, which is the closing part of this session. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat box and we'll put them up later on, hoping we do have some time for that. So, uh, but I'll be brief on this. Thank you. All right. And uh, the, the first speaker actually in this session is Samia Ahiat, who is a system and validation material manager at Valeo. And uh, Samia uh, will be speaking about sensing performance contribution to safety and end user acceptance of automated driving systems. Samia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Agarian, for the nice introduction. I hope you can see my screen. Okay, very good. So um, my presentation will be uh, based on uh, sensing contributions to safety and, and user acceptance. So through these slides, I will try to share with you some highlights about uh, how the sensor technology uh, development contribute to increase these indicators from end user perspective. My presentation will be based on some examples um, like the Euro NCAP, the regulation, and some industry uh, indicators like the availability, the performance, and the safety to illustrate somehow um, how the uh, sensing impacts these aspects and these indicators in one hand. And of course, the sensors are not only meant to answer or to respond the current uh, regulations and standards, but also to push the future ones um, through a technological uh, roadmap and a readiness um, uh, development plan, I would say. My first example is with the Euro NCAP. I think you all know uh, that the Euro NCAP assessment is one of the major indicators looked by the end users when uh, choosing a new car or when comparing two brands. And the sensing system is the most dimensioning factor, like you can see in the, in the picture, uh, in the illustration here, where we have two sensor sets with different uh, simulation uh, results in terms of performance and in terms of, I would say, collision avoidance or collision mitigation. So this is to say that the simulation is one of the, um, the main assets we use in terms of uh, sensing development and sensing uh, testing in each single company, of course. And we see also that in the near future, starting from 2023, the, the simulation will become an official tool for the Euro NCAP assessment. But a major gap still remains today in terms of uh, qualification of simulation tools and in terms of qualification of models and fidelity level. Thus, we need to uh, put some effort there in order to uh, uh, bring the simulation tools and this kind of, of means to the right level of maturity and um, representativeness. The second example is with the regulation, in particular the ALKS1. Um, where we see today um, the industry pushing for higher operation speeds and indeed uh, higher ranges and more re resolutions when we're talking about sensor 
technologies. In addition, also, of course, to um, additional features like the automated land change in nominal operations, but also in, in case of uh, minimum risk maneuver or failure mitigation strategies. In addition to that, the ADS in general and the sensing in particular um, shall um, behave and demonstrate that we reach um, a certain level of safety, at least as good as the human one in average, but also in each single situation. And we believe within Valeo that we only can reach this level of safety and these requirements uh, with redundancy and sensors diversity. My next example is regarding the scenario uh, database or the scenario utilization in the development and the validation process of an AD system. We all know that the mileage target um, we, we, we would like to achieve is not realistic. We're talking about 11 or uh, tens of billions of, of miles, um, which is not uh, achievable only by, by read, uh, read recorded data. This is why we think we need a complementary, uh, I would say, approach based on the scenario uh, structure and database where we could monitor and follow the development in terms of, of maturity, in terms of uh, function availability and in terms of safety indicators as well. We see in the market today a lot of scenario database emerging, which is a very good thing. But the major point is that we are not yet at the right maturity level or at the right industry deployment level. And here also we need to put some effort in order to bring it to the right um, industry um, requirement level. And my last example is uh, regarding the safety target we would like to achieve from the functional, from the system overall point of view, where we see that the sensor technologies play a major um, part or has a, a major part in it because, um, of course, the, the, the function target can be derived from, um, from accident statistics, for example, in a certain ODD. And we derive, in the second step, the sensors um, performances in terms of false positive and false negative rate from the function quantitative target. So it's quite dependent and quite related. We are talking here about uh, 10 minus 7, 10 minus 8 failure or malfunction per hours of driving, which is a very, which is a very stringent uh, target, I would say. And we believe here we need some sophisticated fusion um, strategies in, in addition to uh, driving policy strategies as well uh, to uh, reach in a realistic way these targets we are talking about. And of course, we also see um, a need and uh, a trend toward building a common uh, methodology to be able to demonstrate that we have reached the overall safety target using all the components of the, of the vehicle um, from, from safety perspective. And just to, uh, to summarize the, the key messages, I wanted to uh, highlight the fact that Valeo Sensors Roadmap is aligned with the current expectations and um, from an end user uh, point of view for safety, performance and availability, but also we are pushing um, for the next and the future ones. In addition to that, we believe also that we need to maintain and to continue the collaboration and the partnerships um, towards standardizing and uh, toward the preparation of the future homologation for ADS uh, for certain topics, like, for example, the simulation qualification, in addition to the scenario databases bringing to the right level of maturity, and finally, to participate all together to, um, to the common uh, I would say, uh, methodology about uh, how uh, we demonstrate that we have reached the right level of safety for ADS in general. So thank you for listening. I would be happy to answer some questions if we still have, have some time for that. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Wrong click. Sorry. Uh, Samia, thank you very much. If there were, um, the audience would be here in the room here. I think you would have gotten a great applause here and uh, so take my thank you uh, instead of that and maybe Marit's. Um, 
Samia, um, that, that was a very exciting and, and interesting topic that we are addressing. And the, the question of what I'm wondering is, and maybe you could explain this very quickly, how do you uh, determine uh, the amount of data that is needed uh, and needs to be recorded, yeah, and the quality of the data that needs to be recorded in, in order to ensure a certain sa safety level here? And I, I think you mentioned it in half, like a half sentence. Maybe you could ex uh, yes. yeah, elaborate a little bit more on that. Yes, so it's um, it's a question that might be answered by many um, many aspects, uh, but we believe that uh, we need at least two things. First one is the quantity of data which can be derived somehow from the the overall target we want to achieve, uh, that might be related to um, safety enhancement of the current accidents, for example. So this is one technique to define the, the, the target, uh, the quantitative targets to be uh, to be uh, uh, tested and to be validated using recorded uh, data, real data, but also simulation data in one hand. But it's not enough. Uh, for that, we need also to verify that the quality is there and that we have covered each single scenario the vehicle might uh, encounter in the real life. And for that, we need this structure with the scenario database and um, this traceability to requirements and so on. So it's, uh, I would say, an overall um, argument uh, that needs to be to be built based on uh, recorded data, testing in test tracks, uh, simulations, and also a rigorous system engineering validation methodology. Yeah, thank you very much. Very clear and on the point. So thank you very much again, Samia. So, Marie. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you, uh, Samia. Our next speaker is Cyprian Grasman. He is a distinguished engineer on radar systems engineering at Infineon. So, Cyprian, the floor is yours. Yep, so let me share. Can you hear me? Yes. That's good. Okay, so I will talk about um, the uh, uh, ADAS challenges which we have ahead and uh, well, I want to pick on one point uh, which is uh, often uh, now discussed uh, recently uh, because there's the discussion coming up. Uh, we might uh, uh, achieve all that without um, uh, multiple sensors but with uh, just camera uh, because of the success also uh, Tesla can show and is motivated by Tesla for example. Um, uh, just want to uh, make a point here that um, uh, our expectation is that uh, we still have uh, to deal with multiple modalities of sensors uh, just to achieve this uh, safety uh, requirements uh, for uh, L4 and L5. And um, as a matter of fact, this comes then also with the need of uh, coordination uh, and standardization, especially for the uh, sensors like radar where you have um, uh, and, and transmit behavior and receive behavior, which uh, then potentially leads to interferences and therefore some uh, problems which you have to solve by coordination. Um, and as a matter of fact, when uh, uh, agreeing to this uh, assumption that we still have to deal with a multitude of uh, sensor modalities, uh, this even makes the um, problem more severe with respect to the data flow, uh, the amount of data within the car uh, and uh, the compute performance which you need to uh, uh, provide to compute all this data and to fuse it. So this, this gets uh, uh, very severe and uh, this is actually the other point which I want to make here uh, that uh, we have to have uh, a very clear um, um, trajectory towards uh, the system solution which requires uh, a stronger collaboration across the different disciplines talking about uh, uh, OEM tier one, tier two, uh, which uh, is I think for these complexity of systems not yet at the level which we uh, would require it, it uh, to be. Um, and uh, if we look at these uh, fusion scenarios this is what currently is more or less discussed uh, and under evaluation, but we're still not at the point what is really the, the sweet spot, but very hot discussions going on. If you look at the uh, left-hand side, uh, this would be a decentralized processing concept where you have the, the sensor nodes, which um, uh, contain uh, substantial processing. So they um, 
bring down also the data rates substantially by processing uh, the sensor uh, input much more than um, in uh, the right-hand scenario where you have simple sensor nodes uh, but with high bandwidth outputs with uh, unprocessed data going to a central node which uh, is then rather more powerful and complex uh, being able to handle all these uh, data streams and um, uh, uh, this is also the major difference to the to the decentralized system where the, the central node is uh, simpler can be also easier doubled up uh, for uh, for safety uh, aspects that means if you have to uh, um, switch uh, the the processing unit uh, due to defects or some uh, similar things and certainly there's the whole myriad of uh, alternative uh, approaches in between with hybrid approaches um, um, domain controllers for let's say the front the uh, the rear or the different sensor modalities and uh, more or less uh, complex central units uh, and i think um, it is quite often driven by the by the cost uh, for for good reason um, that's uh, that's why um, also a lot of people are in the favor of the uh, of the centralized processing having this uh, uh, dense on one place which comes with a uh, with the criticality that you have extremely high bandwidth connections there which need to be also swallowed by this entity and uh, a defect or uh, in this area is uh, is highly critical uh, and it's very costly to keep this as a backup system twice uh, in the car uh, while on the on the decentralized uh, version you would have the benefit of a higher robustness um, going with that approach um, as said you might also easier double up the central processing unit and relying on the still available processing sensor inputs yeah and um, uh, uh, saying that um, I think it should be also put more in the focus about uh, availability especially for the uh, fully autonomous driving um, that uh, uh, in this discussion and uh, the path to the solution which we target at the end uh, in the car uh, which is still uh, an area which uh, requires a lot of uh, research and, and development here um, why this is so critical with the, with the data streams often I uh, perceive that people have no uh, clear understanding about the um, uh, data rates which, uh, which are present uh, and here it's just an example it's a little bit busy slide but it's uh, I will focus you on the main aspects um, here you see in the bottom uh, line uh, the data rates so this is for a radar device of today's uh, complexity you have four receivers usually three transmitters and it comes out to be a 200 megabyte per second um, um, and kind of max rate um, then uh, the usual processing the radar uh, doesn't bring it down in the first stage uh, this is pretty much the same but as soon as you do detections uh, so you select the the important reflections out of this um, then you come substantially down with the data rate and uh, it is also a kind of intelligent compression because you focus on that what you see there and you might uh, on the other hand add then some context information uh, instead of transferring the whole uh, um, data brute force um, when you for example talking about 12 of these sensors then in the system or even higher resolution sensors um, uh, drowning then in the already in the data stream uh, and I think this is the other part which I want to point out it is quite uh, important to find the intelligent way of uh, to balance um, this local processing and central processing and uh, not only because of the overwhelming data stream and, and process power which you need for that which also causes a, a power problem um, but also due to the robustness as I mentioned beforehand uh, from a safety perspective um, and that should uh, get uh, from my point of view a little bit closer into the focus um, but what we see today is definitely when when you move uh, uh, up in the in the levels of uh, 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 autom um, automation uh, that there is a trend to move further towards the um, uh, towards the 
raw data, which comes out with an A to D converter, and therefore uh, we we should carefully watch this and and uh, work on on more intelligent ways to deal with this and deal with uh, context information, but compressed data sets. Um, the reason uh, why this uh, is uh, important, as I said, is also the power consumption. And here, uh, the president gave uh, some uh, estimation uh, during DAC 2018. When we move from L3 to L4.5, uh, it would be rather close to a, a tripling of the power consumption, which the compute alone needs. Uh, and therefore, uh, that already has a, a, a deeper impact to the um, range of an electric car, for example. Therefore, deploying such systems uh, will substantially reduce the range of, uh, of uh, an electric car at the end. And as we anyway still need uh, out, um, artificial intelligence to uh, cope with these complex uh, fusion uh, problems and uh, uh, getting, getting the right answers and pattern recognitions in place, um, there's uh, a need to classically work on the algorithms to get the power consumption down, making these uh, networks as efficient as possible when uh, dealing with the standard approaches uh, of artificial intelligence. But on the other hand, uh, it's also a strong um, statement for uh, um, looking into neuromorphic solutions uh, with spike-based uh, uh, computation, uh, which are mostly analog implemented and promising uh, a lower power consumption and a high robustness with a low latency. So this is another area which uh, uh, we see to be uh, getting more and more relevant um, because we have to attack this problem from multiple angles, uh, which includes such an angle to make artificial intelligence also much more uh, power efficient um, uh, to be deployed in, uh, in such solutions. Yeah, this would be from my side. Thank you. If you have any, any questions, go ahead. So thank you, Cyprian. It's quite a different perspective than, uh, than the first presentation. And I think that's also why we come together in sessions like this to challenge ourselves to think a bit wider. Um, can, can you tell me a bit, what do you need, actually? What are your needs to come to a balanced approach to, to work on centralized or decentralized sense of fusion? What are the most eminent needs that you have? Um, the key point is um, uh, that that the sensor systems are still uh, somewhat evolving. That means you, uh, um, especially when you look at um, uh, radar, uh, it's less for camera, but it depends on the and the sensor modality. But specifically for radar, you have uh, quite different um, uh, approaches. It's not so mature. Uh, um, the, the the solutions are still quite some individual. And as a matter of fact, there's not such a standardization. Um, and uh, therefore, it's also not so easy to make a cut and say, okay, this degree of pre-processing makes most sense. Uh, this is common sense understood and will be deployed. Uh, and here, here's the, the, the biggest challenge to get this uh, better controlled and, and also uh, agreed amongst the people uh, to have uh, come closer to a, a more platform-based approach and uh, standardized uh, approach to deal with this radar signals. Okay, thank you very much, Cyprian. Thank you. Welcome. All right, so this will bring us to um, the next speaker. And that, that is a person representing yet another chip maker, uh, actually Intel. Um, the speaker's name is Philippe Olivier Millet. He's the director of automated driving technical policy and uh, at Intel. And uh, Pierre Olivier will talk about automation and mobility and what's next. And we are very curious to understand what will be next. Thank you very much, uh, Guerion, and thank you for the uh, the opportunity, this privilege to be able to present today. Uh, indeed, I'm approaching this from yet another perspective. So from the point of view of decision making, automated vehicle decision making and safety and what we need now to be able to uh, very concretely put these vehicles on the road. Uh, I want to make sure, can you see my presentation properly? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you. So, uh, well, yes, here, if you look at the background picture, you know, this is from um, the early 1920s. 
in this case, at a time when the car had become more uh, accessible. The bicycle also, as we know it today, was a fairly recent invention. But traffic rules were few and far between, and that meant that large industrialized cities uh, in that era were actually a relatively unsafe place where to be on the road. Uh, eventually, this was resolved through inventions like the traffic light, the adoption of traffic rules, of driver training, and so on, through the, the adoption, in other words, of this sort of standard definition of, uh, of safety, of what it means to be safe on the road. Now, imagine now uh, what, what would happen. What if every automated vehicle on the road had a different definition? What if we had different definitions everywhere of what it means to be safe, or uh, if even accidents resulted in an endless string of lawsuits about whether a certain action was safe or not. Concretely, it would mean that it would be very difficult to have real world applications of uh, the real world implementation of automated vehicles that ultimately, unless we have this agreement of what it means, uh, on what it means for an automated vehicle to drive safely, uh, it's difficult to envision how we could have widespread adoption and acceptance of automated vehicles. Now, I will gloss over this very quickly. I think many people today uh, in attendance will be somewhat familiar, at least with this. There are many regulatory initiatives at the moment that aim at defining certain standards, certain boundaries for the safety of automated vehicles. We see them at the UN, truly a multinational effort. Uh, the EU has tight deadline, actually, has to come up with uh, an act for the type approval of automated vehicles by the end of this year. There are national initiatives in Europe. Germany uh, is, is finalizing its own law at the moment as a sort of placeholder to enable the deployment of vehicles until uh, such time as there is a European regulation on the matter. And there are initiatives elsewhere in the world, in China, in Japan, in the US, at different stages uh, of evolution. Now, then in, in this case, what does driving safely mean? Well, it's largely a matter of setting a risk balance. Uh, this is what we have to do if we set a speed limit. So it means setting a risk balance that would be socially acceptable and to be able to prove that we are following and adhering to this prescribed risk balance. Uh, I would like to quickly contrast then and compare a bit uh, human driving as we know it today and automated vehicles. Uh, in human driving, this is a rule that I think is uh, taught or even prescribed in, in many countries nowadays that as a driver, you have to keep a two second headway between the vehicle in front of you and your own car. Uh, it's an approximation because of course, human drivers have uh, limited uh, abilities in terms of, of sensing, of knowing the distance and so on. Uh, it's not necessarily always accurate. Sometimes it can be too much. Sometimes it can be too little, but it's a shortcut that we use as humans. But with automated vehicles, we're looking at something else. EVs have a better way. They don't have to guess, really, because they have access to data. Here now, of course, I'm using our own model, Intel's RSS model. I don't want to go into uh, details about this again, because uh, I think we've already presented about this in the past. But the main thing to keep in mind here is that an automated vehicle has access to sensors, to very elaborate means of processing the data. We can set parameters, for example, like the maximum braking of the vehicle in front, the response time in the system and so on. We can set all of those precisely to determine what exactly is the safe distance for an automated vehicle to follow another. Now, however, if we look at this specific parameter here, for example, the maximum braking of the leading vehicle, what kind of value can we assign to it really? One of my colleagues in the US has put together this, this table where you see, um, data values ranging from uh, um, a full-size pickup truck, very large and heavy vehicle, Ford F-150 that has longer braking distances, uh, down to, to a uh, very high performance vehicle that can st stop very quickly, uh, can have very high uh, braking deceleration. But if you look at NHTSA research, then the average driver applies actually much less force when the time comes to break in an emergency situation. So what do you pick exactly? How do we agree on something that would work for everyone? And this is where I think we really need this sort of model of two-headed effort because we have the industry on one hand that is in a very good position to define the parameters themselves. We know what goes into an automated driving system, what sort of parameters we use in driving. And at the same time, we also need governments 
on behalf of society to pick values for these parameters and to decide ultimately on the risk balance itself and what they consider to be acceptable. We have this today, for example, parameter could be the speed limit that in some situations would be set, for example, at 90 kilometers an hour. We have also sound requirements for electric vehicles. But what we need is also the sort of parameter for uh, automated vehicles. For example, this assume maximum braking for the leading vehicle. Uh, the reason why we need this ultimately is, is largely a matter of transparency. I think has, as um, aviation and how successful we've been safety-wise in aviation has proven transparency is key. Uh, we need also transparency to be able to collaborate as the industry. And most of all, it is key to being able to assuring and reassuring a wary public about the viability and the safety of automated driving. The bottom line is that safety should not be a point of differentiation. I believe that manufacturers and so on should be free to have their own driving logic, their own approach, their own technology. However, when it comes to what we define as safe behavior, this should be common ground. Uh, I would like to, to follow up on this with a, a call to action and an invitation even because uh, at Intel we consider this to be so important that my colleague uh, Jack Wiest has had the privilege of sharing a group within the uh, IEEE. Of course, it's an American organization, but it is a truly global effort. Uh, they are working on standard P2846, which is looking at assumptions that can be used for the models and safety related uh, AV behavior. So in other words, which kind of parameters as industry should we consider and should we submit for consideration when it comes to agreeing on a risk balance? Uh, it's an important effort that at the moment involves over 25 entities. And of course, we always welcome more uh, participants. And this is the kind of work that we uh, have, been, uh, have been doing in this group. We have been looking at different uh, values involving different types of road users, what kind of acceleration value. Again, we are not setting values, but we are suggesting parameters. So uh, again, I believe that this is the next step and this is what will enable us to put these vehicles on the road. Thank you very much for your attention. And of course, if there are questions, I would be more than happy to take them. Yeah, great. Uh, uh, Pierre-Olivier, uh, for this yeah, little introduction into the regulatory considerations or regulation um, uh, considerations from the perspective of, uh, yeah, a component maker and an enabling technology maker. Um, the question that I would have is a bit related to that. And, um, Assuming that we are having, will be having uh, artificial intelligence at some point, whether in the vehicle or maybe in the cloud or at the edge or so, um, it might be important to understand what the safety logic of automated driving at high level is. Is it still bottom up like um, it was in, in human driving or is it more uh, in a, a top-down safety logic. Could you try to, to respond to that? Because that, of course, has quite an impact on the technologies you need, don't, doesn't it? Well, it does. And especially, you know, if we bring AI into this, it adds an element of unpredictability in the mix. And especially if you look at it from a strictly regulatory point of view, the regulator does not like this kind of unpredictability. At the heart, for example, of, of uh, the European approach, you have type approval, the type approval process, which looks at how a vehicle is and how it should perform and how each vehicle should be identical. But of course, if you bring AI into this, then with machine learning, things get a lot more complicated and you don't necessarily have this consistency, which is why what we propose and, and even this RSS model that we have been submitting as a, as a potential approach is something to define the boundaries of safe behavior. I don't think that it would be good for the industry to have a sort of standard driving logic or standard behavior across the board. This is an element of differentiation, but there should clearly be boundaries to what a vehicle can and cannot do that are based on what machines can and cannot do and not some uh, human assumption or, or shortcut that we are still using today. Yeah, probably we should could, could talk for, for hours about this because it's a, that's a very important part of, of this whole discussion. Yeah, uh, thank you, Pierre-Olivier, again for your presentation and for the explanations and I'll see you back later in the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Pierre-Olivier. Let's move on to our fourth speaker who is Maurits Antlanger. He is system architect at TT Tech Automoto Auto. So please uh, Maurits, the floor is yours. 
you very much. One moment. Whoop. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Oh. Good. Good. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to talk about challenging and designing fail operational AD architectures. Um, so if you look at um, automated driving right now, what you can buy are at best driving assistance features. So level two, according to the classification scheme by the SAE, um, which means that you as the driver are responsible for permanently supervising the system. And in case that it fails, you need to take over immediately. In the next few years, we will hopefully then move beyond that to level three and level four features, where the system takes over, at least temporarily, full responsibility also for supervising itself. And in case any part of the system fails, it still needs to maintain safety for the vehicle and the passengers. Uh, in short, basically the, the system also now needs to be fail operational. It needs to be available no matter what. Um, now, when it comes to making a system fail operational, what you need to do is basically you need to make uh, every functionality that is important, robust to it failing. A uh, simple approach for doing that is to make it redundant. So you duplicate the functionality. Uh, that already you need to apply to a lot of different things in the vehicle. Uh, so you need to think about the electronic control units. You need to have two of them. They need to be in different locations. You need to have multiple power supplies, communication networks, sensors, and also actuators. Um, in this talk, I would like to focus more on um, the ECUs, so the control elements, uh, and the associated software. Um, here already you face the problem, if you have two of them, who actually gets to, to control the vehicle? Uh, so you need some kind of uh, redundancy management system for this. Um, here it's a bit tricky because um, uh, road traffic is a rather complex environment, and there is lots of possible solutions. All of them might be correct. Uh, so a standard approach that you get from aerospace, which is shown here on the left side, uh, where you basically make multiple channels and afterwards uh, you just do some majority voting and say, okay, the majority will be right. That doesn't work easily if the functionality needs to be uh, implemented in, in a diverse way. And we usually need that uh, in order to preclude any systematic faults. Instead, a more robust approach that you can use uh, shown here on the right side, you can make a, a fail silent system. So something that either produces correct output or remains silent, so produces none. And then another channel, a fallback channel, uh, which basically just takes over in case the, the other one is silent. Another problem that you face is you need to, in short, combine safety and high performance. Um, because usually you get some competition between how safe an output is, so how sure we can be that it is correct, and how complex functionality you can do with it. So traditionally what you had in automotive was that you have um, these safety controllers with very high integrity, but that are usually not very performant. And the software that you write for these, that's all human written code, uh, usually not that many lines of code, uh, is heavily validated and verified and so on, but you can't do very complex functionality with this. In particular, when it comes to computer vision, for example, or anything that employs machine learning, uh, you need very powerful hardware. You need GPUs and accelerators, and also the software that you develop for it, uh, that's based a lot on data, and you can't easily verify that anymore. And testing also only works to a certain uh, degree. From making automated driving systems, we now need to have both of these. We need complex functionality, and we need high integrity. Uh, one way for, one strategy for combining that uh, is what's called decomposition schemes. So you can take high integrity elements and decompose them into two lower integrity elements, providing the same or similar functionality. Again, similar to what we had before, uh, you face the problem, okay, if I have two of them, which one do I take? Which output is the, the right one? Uh, what's shown here on the left side grayed out is um, for simple functionality where you have we just duplicate the same function, exactly the same code, you can easily compare them uh, whether they, they produce exactly the same output. Um, that's, for example, in lockstep mechanisms. For complex functionalities, you can't formally verify the code anymore, which means that uh, systematic faults can always catch up to you. Uh, the only way to in any way address this is to implement that functionality in a diverse way, and then you don't get the same output. Uh, an interesting approach for, uh, in that case, um, these decomposition schemes is called a dual checker approach, shown here on the right side. Uh, in that case, you have one function providing the, the actual desired outputs, so the actual functionality, and then you have a second function, which is implemented in a completely different and diverse way, which only checks whether the, the outputs are correct. And that's usually a lot easier task to accomplish. 
if we now combine both of these strategies I've shown you before, so decomposing for availability and decomposing for integrity into a single system architecture, what we end up with looks somewhat like this here. So we have a three channel architecture, we have a doer, a checker and a fallback, so these orange boxes, and then underneath we have a redundancy management system. Important to note here is that on the one side, doer, checker and fallback, they need to be diverse in hardware or preferentially in hardware, but definitely also in software. So that's difficult to achieve. What's good for you on the other hand is that the checker and the fallback, those um, can be a lot simpler. So they don't need to provide the full functionality as the doer does. So they can be smaller in hardware, they can also be more robust and smaller and simpler. Um, also, what's an interesting aspect is um, the consumers uh, only should usually only see the doer channel, so what that does, which means that the check and the fallback, they are more in the background, they are there for safety, they need to be good enough, you need to be able to trust them. But that also means that for an OEM, where they should differentiate is on the doer side. On the check and fallback, that's a prime target for talking about it openly, for standardizing it, and maybe even making it generic parts. Finally, I'd also like to talk a bit about what we are doing at TTTech in order to facilitate uh, making such a system architecture true uh, reality. Uh, so one thing that we participated in is the Pristine program, uh, which dealt with uh, building a fail operational uh, environment perception in urban areas. In particular, we were dealing with a failover management, so this redundancy management part. Also, what we're working on in-house is uh, what we call the motion-wise safety co-pilot, which essentially covers this checker channel here and um, primarily is comprised of a set of validation modules that supervise certain safety goals of the doer. That looks roughly like this here. So you can see that there's uh, trajectories being produced on the left side. And then we have a set of validation modules which supervise um, certain safety goals, for example, against collisions or against uh, difficult to drive trajectories. And you can see that in these dials below uh, the certain risk scores that are being evaluated, uh, you can see those can increase if certain bad things happen. And you can use that for basically saying the doer is faulty. Uh, finally, at TTTech, we are also convinced that cooperation is really essential for getting AD or making AD safe. And this is why we've initiated a community called The Autonomous, where we partner with lots of people from the industry and academia on discussing safety from various angles. The Autonomous is um, comprised of both an event stream. So there is, um, if you're interested, there is a main event on September 29th in Vienna, where you have the chance to, inter um, to connect with lots of uh, top executives from the ED industry and an innovation stream uh, where shown below these uh, multiple topics that we are talking about. So architecture, security, regulation, AI, and sensor fusion. Uh, on each of these topics, there is chapter events throughout the year that you can attend. And also we have now kicked off recently uh, our first working group on safety and architecture. Uh, so if you're interested in attending one of the events or in joining the, one of the working groups, uh, please check out the homepage at themanagedautonomous.com and get in touch with the team. They will be happy to talk to you. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude. Um, so key takeaways for level three, level four, um, availability, so fail operation, that becomes really important. That is now part of safety. We need to talk about the architecture, getting this right. You can't just bolt it on afterwards. Uh, and also there is certain parts where it makes more sense to cooperate on and standardize them uh, than to compete on them. Yeah, thank you very much. No, thank you very much, Marit. Um, uh, you, you talked about a bit about the, uh, the balancing in adding more sensors and in uh, mm -hmm. what cost that brings along uh, and strategies for that. Did you include also some of the things that uh, that one of the previous speakers, uh, Cyprian, uh, discussed about the, the, the energy use also uh, for the power consumption there? Um, well. I I wasn't talking about the power consumption so much, but yes, that's also a part, but primarily for the sensor set, it's also about cost. I mean, each of these mm -hmm. sensors costs more money. So you really want to, to um, make this uh, as small as possible while maintaining safety. And that's already quite tricky. I mean, as I've uh, shown before, we need for a generic architecture, we need three different channels. So we need, in, in optimum case, we would have three completely separate and disjunct sensor sets. That's not affordable usually. Um, so what you would, uh, well, there's multiple approaches uh, proposed by different players. So some people say you should make one system that drives by camera only, one by LIDAR only, one by radar only, then you can be perfectly certain. Others say, no, you should share many sensors, but you need to then look in your sensor fusion, in your planning algorithms, 
how you make that system robust to the shared census failing because you need to really analyze can any failure in the system bring down more than one channel because then you would no longer be safe okay. um, here usually what you would do is that the, the primary functionality that should get as many censuses as possible and then for the uh, the check and the fallback as i said uh, those can be smaller those can be simpler um, because you don't need to provide the full functionality you don't need to drive comfortably you just need to uh, give a first opinion is this safe or not and if it's not safe to really just come to a control stop and that's much easier to accomplish okay thank you Maurice. maybe we'll touch up on that later on in the panel discussion so we'll see what happens yep. there so thank, thank you very much. much and it was nice uh, to see uh, Moritz mentioning that this is a project um, or th that this work is partly done within the Pristine project. And Pristine is a project out of the Excel joint undertaking. That's the link between the, um, the Excel and KDT enabling technologies world and the CCAM application board for, for connected automated mobility that uh, Benjamin Wilch was mentioning with the Lighthouse Mobility eTalk before. So our next speaker is uh, Philip Hubertus, who is the product manager for autonomous driving with HERE. And uh, Hubertus, hello, uh, Philip uh, Hubertus, hello. Uh, from uh, the, the, the title of your talk is From Driving Assistance to Driving Automation, Location Data as a Critical Factor for Automated Driving. The floor is yours, Philip. Thank you for the introduction. Automated driving promises mobility with more comfort and less excellence. It also promises a different quality of mobility to free inner cities from traffic jams and parking problems. And it is forecasted to be a billion dollar business. Future is bright. Uh, where are we on the way to get there is the big question mark. So um, let's take a moment to take us all onto the same page here. The SAE level zero, one and two, um, the, the drivers are still driving all the time, right? and they may get help by driver assistance features. They need to constantly supervise their vehicles. It may like feel like automated driving, and some OEMs are marketed as such, but advanced driver assistance is the better term to use. How well this works and the trust these systems build is what paves the way to real driving automation. At Philip, SAE, do you I'm have, do you have uh, slides? For your presentation we don't see any i have slides uh, are they not showing i'm sorry for no, that. We, we just see the background of your screen so like a big you island see the background of my screen showing i didn't screen. want to interrupt you but i believe it you want to yeah. do something yeah <laughs> oh, no let's try again can you maybe right. leave the presentation mode or something yeah, and we Probably stop this showing screen two. You know. mm -hmm. there, there, I do at least see uh, now kind of an editor now. Uh, Let's see, I'll try again. Yeah, there it is. Go ahead. That looks good. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So um, when you look on the right side, uh, the SAE level three and above, that's where the vehicle systems are driving. And today these levels are still extremely limited and complex to scale. That is why OEMs restrict the usage of features on level three and above to selected road types and areas, mostly well built out and maintained motorways with at least two lanes in each direction and a middle barrier. Likewise, robot taxis are confined in where they can drive. Uh, today, you cannot hail one and tell it to drive you wherever. They only operate in a predefined area and are supported by human operators when they get stuck in an unpredictable situation. It is indisputable that automated driving is on a steep learning curve. And what is important to understand is that the industry needs to find a balance between idealistic scenarios and what is technically and commercially possible at scale. Some believe in an idealistic scenario where a perception stack combined with artificial intelligence will be able to fully understand the real world around an automated vehicle and the many different scenarios and road users that you will encounter, no map needed. Some believe in an idealistic scenario in which highly precise, highly detailed and highly up-to-date map data provides a lot of data an automated vehicle needs to operate. Why am I calling this idealistic? Let me explain. Let's 
Let's talk about just three of many challenges of automated driving and how a map can help. First, the compute environment is constrained. For example, by the amount of power available to run ECUs, we've heard that before. Less data to crunch means a lower power consumption, and that means more mileage for the vehicle, especially when it's electric. But at the same time, more data means the vehicle can understand its surroundings better and make better decisions. The question really is how much sensor and map data is enough and how much is too much? This is a question we need to collaborate on in the industry because when we share and pool sensor data, when we work together and use this data to update and maintain a map data set as an additional sensor, then we will all win because we enable scale across markets and brands for driver assistance and automated driving features. And here, we are sourcing and conflating, validating and publishing map data. Our platform is open for customers from across industries and we're embracing collaborative automotive industry data standards like Sensoris for sensor data and NDS for map data publications to offer automotive map products for ISA, ADAS, navigation and automated driving. Secondly, map data can be a great reference, an additional sensor to aid with overcoming some of the limitations of the conception stack. Mistaking a semi-truck trailer for an overhead gantry shouldn't happen easily if you have a map providing data on what the road ahead uh, and the road furniture looks like. When a vehicle uses an electronic horizon powered by map data, we can understand the road ahead better and see farther ahead than its sensors can see it will be able to go a little faster and at the same time keep the comfort level of passengers high. An electronic horizon powered by high definition map data also supports the vehicle not ever losing its position as that HD map includes highly precise localization objects that the vehicle can reference itself to. And that is why at here we're building our HD live map with three clusters of data layers. The road model layer of the HD live map provides data farther than the sensors can see. It also includes data sensors cannot see at all because the information is not signposted or observable, like road rules. With this, it helps vehicles to adjust to upcoming situations early and keep passengers comfortable. Road model data can be used for driver assistance features and is the base layer for the other two layers of data. The second layer of the HD Live Map is the precise lane model. Uh, it provides data about lane paths, lane types, lane markings, lane widths, and more. And it's important for the lateral vehicle position, answering the question, what lane am I in? It supports lane keeping and drive assistance and in automated driving mode. And it supports vehicle to make the right decisions at the right time. For example, active lane changes and being prepared for lane changes of other road users. And then the third layer is the localization model and it supports vehicles with localizing themselves precisely in the environment while supporting sensors to make sense of what they see. The needed high precision placement of localization objects in the map is not achievable with standard sensors in production vehicles today. It needs a more advanced measurement system, which our here true system provides. That's the cars that we drive the roads with to create uh, our map. And after the compute environment and after map data, I have one last and third item. So let's talk about scale. At, at here, we enable our customers to add driver assistance and automated driving in production vehicles today. We want these vehicles to be able to offer a great consumer experience wherever the owners buy and take them. For us, it's not good enough if this only works in a few selected areas. We have a global spec, local experts in our field offices around the world because there are significant differences in road rules and in the way other road users behave on a micro level. Driving in downtown Frankfurt, Germany is driving is different than driving in Paris or Rome. And driving in most city centers is different than in the suburban areas or countrysides where owners of premium cars with self-driving features may be at home or retreat for the weekends. You need to understand these differences and account for them in the data design. And remember here in Europe, unlike in Phoenix or the Bay Area, we have beautiful seasons with gorgeous changes of the environment, refreshing springs with lots of rain that turn barren scrubs into dense greens. We have beautiful summers with glaring sun, cyclists on the roads in cities and on national roads. We have golden autumns with falling leaves and fog, we have frigid winters with snow. 
And that means a constant change of the environment. And it means a map model of the environment is not static, it's highly dynamic. And that's why at here we do constant map maintenance using a highly diverse mix of third party sources. We have local field experts, a global organization with diverse backgrounds that have local road rules and unobservable data to our map. And we use our here true cars to get a highly precise data, more precise than production vehicle sensors can provide them. And to maintain the data and identify changes, we use an increasingly growing pool of sensor and probe data that all feed into our map making process. And we highly automate that. Uh, and our publication pipelines so that real world changes are published much faster. So to wrap it up real quick, together we are on a steep learning curve with automated driving. We need to take consumers along on the journey and evolution ahead. The perfecting driving assistance systems is a key stepstone towards automated driving and consumer adoption. And when we solve and learn how to best manage the compute environment, the data from sensors and map and dealing with scale and environmental differences that come with that, then we're on a good path and we need to be a little bit more flexible and faster with that. Intelligent speed assistance regulation in Europe is a welcome development, I think. We introduce basic driver assistance systems into nearly every vehicle on the European road. Mandatory lane assistance is next. And then if we get this right, then I'm sure we will see a higher and faster adoption of that, advanced driver systems. That will be very, very yeah. exciting, Philip. We will um, discuss more later in the panel, so we'll definitely... Yeah try at least to touch upon that topic again. But uh, I think we should continue. Marit, who is next? Well, our next speaker, and thank you, Philippe, again. Our next speaker is Michele Giorelli from, the, from uh, Aptiv, uh, and a technical manager of the, of the advanced systems engineering. So, um, well, Michele, it's your turn. We can already see your screen, but not yet the presentation. And I cannot hear you. Maybe you're muted still. Okay. Yes. I guess you can see. I, you yes, can see now I can see your slides and I can hear you as well. Thank you. You can get wow. off. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the. Oh, sorry. Can you see my screen, right? Yes, I can. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yep. So thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, let me start just to highlight the agenda of my of my speech. We I would like to go during uh, this uh, uh, this presentation through three main points. The first one is to highlight the gap on the standardization. The second one is to understand what are the main recommendations, what is next on the standardization. And then I will conclude my presentation with uh, the status quo on the exemption approval and also make some proposal on it, based on our experience. Very important preliminary information that I would like to highlight during uh, this presentation. First of all, all this study is funded, is funded by Arcade L3 pilot project. Secondly, so all finding on the standardization are already uh, published on the arcade knowledge base. There you can find more with respect, I will tell you today. Third point, in the, uh, in the previous UCAT conference, a uh, dedicated, uh, dedicated breakout session on standardization and roadworthiness was organized. And there you can also download all the presentation and recording where you can find more insight related to standardization and roadworthiness. And I would like also to stress that this work that has been done on standardization has also required the collaboration of other partners, in particular of Stellantis CRF. Um, just some number related to the uh, standards. So just we have collected like 175 uh, standards. You can uh, take a look on the website. And in particular, uh, uh, we can see here on the first graph the number of new standards that has been published each year. As you can see, in the last year, the number of, of uh, standards has increased uh, exponentially to reach a peak in 2018. Second point, second point. So we have collected all these standards and we have categorized. They are categorized in two main parts. We have divided in the published standard and the development standard, but we have also categorized them by uh, domains. And here, on the, on the x-axis, you can see 
or the domain that we have characterized our, we have divided our stand. But we cannot comment everything as you can imagine, but I would like to just to comment three main points here. First point, connectivity. Connectivity has an incredible high number of standards. That's uh, it's something that is uh, reasonable because no communication can be established without having a standardization interface, bandwidth, protocol, frequency. So it's pretty normal to see on connectivity a lot of standards. Sec second point on the testing verification validation is the only domain where we see that the number of uh, uh, standards under development is higher than the ones on the already published. The pro probably the reason here is uh, related to the fact that in the last year, in 2017, 2019, there was done already a gap analysis and there was probably a push in the industry to work on this key element, key topic. Third point, uh, artificial intelligence. So our initial research, uh, from our initial research, we don't find any standard on artificial intelligence. That was pretty surprised considering that artificial intelligence is coming in the automotive industry. That's because we start our you know, research by using some keywords like autonomous driving, automating driving, connectivity, and so on. And with this keyword, we don't find anything. That was pretty strange. For that reason, we go uh, further with our investigation to see if there is any additional uh, standard related to artificial intelligence. What we found is that uh, indeed there is uh, an activity in uh, international standard organization related to artificial intelligence. And in particular, there is this committee, subcommittee SC42 uh, on topic of artificial intelligence. In particular, this subcommittee has been split uh, in uh, uh, four working groups, working on foundation standard, big data, trustworthiness, use cases and application. What is very important on, uh, to highlight in, uh, uh, for the automotive industry is indeed the, uh, the work has been done on the trustworthiness, okay? Because in, the, this, in this particular working group, they are uh, focused on these three following tasks. The first one is to establish the, um, the transparency, the verifiability, the explicability, and the controllability of artificial intelligence uh, technique. Second point is to investigate the possible threats or risk of artificial intelligence system. And the third point is to investigate the robustness, the resiliency of the artificial intelligence technique. All these, time, all these three tasks are fundamental for deploying artificial software in connected automating drive. In particular, if you just think about all the thematics of decision making, where the transparency is a key important uh, uh, aspect that we need to take care to explain if something happens. Um, on the gap analysis, we can see also some other points that are very important for us. Uh, the, the gap analysis is a very complex task. It requires a huge number of experts working together. And um, in the, we see in the last year that uh, uh, there, were, there was three organizations they are working on the, uh, understand the gaps and also to try to give recommendation on the, on the, on the standards on connected automating driving. Uh, there was in 2017, International Standard Organization, in 2019, the Verban Dare Indu uh, Automobile Industry, and in 2020, the Canadian Standardization Association Group. In particular, this one, is, uh, we can see that it is uh, very active. Uh, it participated as well in the UCAT conference. And uh, uh, what we know in this moment, that are expecting new report this year, and it's engaged with 53 stakeholders belong to industry and academia. And uh, this is a long collaboration started from, starting since the 2019. Indeed, what we can say that, uh, it, are very crucial for doing a very good gap analysis and also a, a very good uh, recommendation on what are the missing part is that all these organizations, all these associations need to work together. On the, uh, on the standardization, on the recommendation, we can see that there are a lot of recommendations that we can highlight ready to the maps, ready to the adoption of uh, uh, standard on simulation, uh, on the liaison activity between IE and automotive industry. There are a lot. It's not, we have no time to comment everything, but you can find on, online all this recommendation. But very, it's very um, good for uh, also to highlight one of the recommendations that was provided by BDA. Uh, why if you are not standardized a social, a social recognized model, 
to compare the performance of safe automated driving function with respect to human driving performance. Probably, if we, the industries agree on, on some social recognized model, model on safety, probably this could enable or unlock the commercialization of this car in the, in the market. Finally, this is my last time. I would like just to comment related to our experience on to have exception approval in Europe. Uh, our experience is this one. So we have in the L3 pilot to do piloting, across boarding piloting. Uh, we get our car approved in uh, Germany and we have a successful also um, approval from Luxembourg. Probably this, uh, they accept the TOOF certification easily because of, of language, we have the same language. When we try to, uh, to do this, um, approve also, the same uh, the same vehicle in the in France uh, by using the, the certification that, uh, provided by TOOF, we have uh, some problem because they want at least a translation of this documentation. But in the end, we get approval also for in France. In Holland, our experience was uh, uh, we have at the end uh, not get the the, uh, the approval was very difficult because the rules that were imposed by uh, the Dutch authority were very, very uh, strict for us. So at the end, what we can say that, of course, if we went to consider, you know, piloting in the, this whole country of Europe, is imaginable, uh, we can imagine that it should be possible in the future if we approve in one of these countries, should be approved also in the other country without any problem, if it's a pro the documentation provided probably in English. Um, other, um, uh, other point, if there is something changing in the platform, uh, it's not considered at this moment, how will be the process for have again an approval. And also the integration of, of future technology like artificial intelligence probably require an upgrade of approval that has to be considered in the future. This is the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you, Michela. It was very nice to see this part also of, of the standardization and uh, exemption also. It's good to uh, be aware of these things and I hope also in the panel some of these issues uh, can be discussed. So thanks a lot again. Thank you, Michela. And I would say we right. just continue right away. Thank you also from my side to Michele. So uh, our next second keynote speaker at this international workshop on vehicle technologies for connected, cooperative and automated mobility is uh, from an international, bringing in an international perspective from beyond Europe. Uh, we are talking here and we're having the pleasure to introduce to you Ed Straub, who is the director of the Office of Automation at SAE International and uh, SAE, uh, as we all know, is uh, a very important player in the domain of standardization, particularly for um, yeah this domain of connected and automated mobility. We are all uh, observing, using, uh, commenting on the SAE standards for connected and automated driving once in a while, and we are. Um, keen on understanding and would love to to hear from Ed, uh, yeah, what's going on in terms of the processes and recent activities of SAE in this domain. So great to have you here uh, at our little conference at Straub from SAE. And yeah, I hand over to you and uh, we are very excited uh, to see your presentation. Ed, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Can you see my screen and hear me? Very well, and we can hear you also very well. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Um, it's, I'm glad to be here and provide an overview of SAE International, as well as talk about some of the advanced technology standards that are available and currently, um, in process. So I'll, I'll walk through an overview and then and then talk a little bit about those standards and how um, 
different organizations can work with SAE. SAE International has been around for over 100 years from since the beginning, literally, of the automotive industry and the aerospace industries from the time when um, the industry was established and went from uh, tinkerers working in their garage to a coordinated industry and supply chain. Um, over that past century, SAE's evolved um, to include technical papers and conferences uh, we do uh, provide a wide range of professional development and training opportunities to industry and collaboration with university universities around the world. In 20, uh, well, about 20 years ago, our library was first digitized and then in 2016 was made available online through the SAE Mobilist tool. And most recently, SAE has um, addressed the accelerating need for standardization and best practices by establishing the Automated Vehicle Safety Consortium in 2019 under SAE ITC. So now, there are available over 100,000 technical papers and publications. SAE consists of nearly 150,000 members, um, 35,000 aerospace and ground vehicle standards. And although there was obviously uh, exceptional circumstances in 2020, we typically hold over 30 technical conferences a year around the world. I don't need to talk much to this group about the role of standards today. I think we heard the need for standardization from a number of the speakers earlier today, particularly when we talk about efficiencies throughout the supply chain and the roles that standards can play in testing regulations and, and codes of practice. From the ground vehicle perspective, I talked earlier about uh, both SAE being involved both in aerospace and ground vehicle standards. We have nearly 10,000 uh, standards, uh, six councils supervising that standardization and over 500 technical committees. SAE's organization, um, and this is broadly SAE International, so it includes both ground vehicle and aerospace, consists of eight councils, which provide oversight and recommendations to the technical committees and steering committees underneath them. The uh, councils vote to approve the standards that the committees recommend and also establish new committees. The detailed technical work and standardization of uh, individual industry experts is done at the lower levels um, amongst the, the organization of steering committees, technical committees, and task forces or working groups. Anyone can introduce a topic for standardization through a committee. Committees are, uh, committees consist of individuals volunteering and bringing their own technical expertise to bear for the betterment of industry. The process then works as the topic is introduced to the committee uh, it's discussed and refined. The relevant council in, in, in the context of ground vehicle or automotive, that would be the motor vehicle council, uh, approves the work and a document sponsor or volunteer comes forward to lead the initiative. The topic is discussed inside the committee, goes through our open balloting process 
and then comes out as a J document. It's worth talking about, especially when we talk about connected and automated vehicles, the different types of documentation that SAE has available. The more mature a process or technology is, the more likely it is to be a formal industry standard. Earlier in the process or in the life cycle of a technology, as less is known about it or there are less common practices, uh, documents can, can begin as an information report, which is really the industry experts bringing their knowledge and expertise to bear to consolidate all of the available information and publish that in an information report. The industry can then discuss, uh, re refine, and agree over time on what becomes more accepted from more participants in the industry. And then that, that may sometimes graduate into a recommended practice. It may result in a new document being developed. And then over time, again, as more and more standardization happens, it can be formalized as an industry standard. Looking at the early stage of that process, oftentimes there may not be enough information available to develop a standard. So information reports or pre-competitive research is needed. This can be done through SAE's cooperative research program, which can be sponsored by and includes uh, any industry um, companies, industry participants, or even government grant programs that can be targeted to accelerate um, a particular topic area. This happened, or is happening, I should say, as an example in the, in the wireless power transfer. And here you can see uh, some of the participants and the goals and objectives for that program. I'll talk briefly about the uh, ADAS standards that SAE is working on and has available. Here you can see some of the task forces and work that's being done there. And this is relevant because as we move into more advanced levels of automation, things like uh, target standardization become more, more important and the ADAS standards will form a good foundation for follow-on advanced um, technologies. I'm moving through these very quickly, but the slides will be available at the end and I wanted to include all of this for your reference. Our connected technology or connected vehicle standards um, are overseen by SAE's VTAX Communications Steering Committee. You can see the number of technical committees uh, that, that are doing work in various areas across here. And clearly this air standardization in this area is needed to support a number of the earlier talks that we heard about as information and data is communicated from infrastructure to the vehicle, having a standardized format for things like roadway geometries, signal phase and timing, all becomes very critical. Some of the standards you may be familiar with, if not, I'll, I'll quickly introduce them here are the 2735 Message Set Dictionary and the, the J2945 family of standards, which lay out different communications protocols and specifications. For things like road weather requirements and permissions and, and security. The safety message performance requirements is, again, as vehicles become, it introduce increasing levels 
of automation, being able to accommodate uh, more highly variable objects in the environment like VRUs that come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, may behave unpredictably. The communications and safety messages between VRUs and automated vehicles or even uh, active safety systems becomes more important. Some of the work that is currently happening in this uh, committee includes um, adaptive cruise control, uh, recommended practice for uh, map data and signal phase and timing, like I mentioned, map data, including geometries, lanes, uh, locations, and also preemption messages for emergency vehicles. Additional work, you can see here road safety, work zones are obviously a, a challenge for automated vehicles and communicating information about things like that is also very important. Here you can see some other works in progress that are currently underway. Most of SAE's automated driving standards are, though not all, are being developed through our on-road automated driving committee. Here you can see a range of the task forces that are addressing different needs related to automated driving. This group and our taxonomy and definitions task force developed the J3016 levels of automated driving that everyone throughout the world now uses. Other standards that are available um, include things like 3216, which was published last year. Again, many may not be aware of that one. I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but that involves or lays out a taxonomy and definitions for cooperative driving automation, which is the marriage of automation and connectivity. Here are some works in progress. We can expect uh, the, the previous panel talked a little bit about architectures. We can expect a reference architecture to be published later this year that will give industry and regulators a common frame of reference when dealing with the, all of the myriad specific deep, more detailed architectures that were mentioned earlier. We're additionally developing J3164, which will lay out common definitions and uh, taxonomy for automated behaviors and maneuvers. I mentioned J3216. This was a, this, this bucked the normal trend of uh, the amount of time it takes to develop and industry recommended practice. It was accelerated by a grant from the US Department of Transportation uh, to investigate the topic, collect information, and sponsor um, uh, uh, a technical writer to help develop the uh, J3216 recommended practice. And what it does is lay out the different classes of cooperative driving from status sharing where vehicles share uh, their knowledge or understanding of the environment and their status to providing information about actions and ADS intends to take and then the collaboration between one or more vehicles or vehicles and the infrastructure and then prescriptive of course, which is vehicles must do or take a certain task. Other work being done in other um, committees includes, uh, I just want to highlight the data logging task force, which lays out the required data elements and sampling frequency for uh, the event data recorders. And the J3197, was recently updated to add 
automated driving. There's a lot of work going on as well in our safety and human factors committees. I won't talk much about those, but list as reference here a number of the standards that are available or being developed. And finally, many of you are aware of the cybersecurity standards J31 or 3061, which is the uh, recommended practice for cyber physical systems, as well as some collaborative work that SAE has done with ISO. Not all of SAE's work is with passenger vehicles. We are also developing automated vehicle standards for heavy vehicles, including transit buses and uh, commercial trucks. Because there's so much going on, we're working to develop and actually are developing a beta version is available. You can please reach out if you're interested in leveraging this an online, essentially crowdsourced, but curated automated vehicle um, roadmap. And what this does is it's really about tracking ongoing activities as well as needed gaps in standards. So where are standards needed and what work is currently going on in them? We can dive down into various areas here and we're including and ask for input so it can stay updated and current all the resources and efforts that are currently going on. Again, part of my job is to collaborate and do outreach around the globe. Uh, we know that industry and all of your expertise and time is valuable and it's not helpful to spend time in redundant efforts in, with various standards development organizations. So we have a number of memorandums of understanding and collaborative agreements with really all of these groups and are doing our best to harmonize industry standards around the world. So with that, I will close. Um, pending any questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly or to our director in Europe, John Tintinelli, and his information is there. He is based in the Netherlands. Thank you. Yeah, great, Edward. Uh, a very nice and very comprehensive uh, presentation of all of SAE's activities. It's a very rich and deep activity as we've seen. and. Uh, it's also very much appreciate what you do in there that you activate all these um, and inv get involved all these these experts uh, for the committees and there's also a question on that in the, in the chat now saying yeah um, beyond the uh, the tools that you are already provide through the platform for um, for for collaboration is there is it other ways also for uh, people to contribute to the community discussions to get involved in the in the SAE com committees so can you maybe explain that a little bit sure SAE committees are open to anyone anyone can participate in an SAE committee you don't necessarily even have to be a member of SAE to participate in a committee all you need to do is reach out or go through the SAE.org website and find the committee that you're interested in and inquire. Or if, if not that, send me an email and I'll be happy to put you in contact with the right person. You mentioned your colleague, John, who is uh, representing SAE in Europe. Um, maybe also a little word about what you expect to see in uh, maybe a bit stronger collaboration with with Europe that this, this seems to be indicating. Is John on? We had talked about a little bit about him being able to speak him for himself, but if not, um, we're doing work uh, again to take a more active role in Europe. Uh, so there's collaboration I know with Dean 
and Tufsud that SAE is actively working. Um, we also have memorandums of understanding with OSM and have been communicating fairly regularly with uh, uh, the British Standards Institute and our um, SAE has a long-standing collaborative agreement with ISO to develop joint standards as well. But um, yeah, reach out to John and he can certainly provide more information. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your time and for your contribution. All right, thank you. And if thank you, you would, for having me. If you would see the 200 people here in the room, that would be great applause. So um, this I can just assure you. <laughs> so <laughs> hope to see you also. Uh, very soon uh, in, in physical meetings. Okay, over to Thanks. David. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you also to Gary and Marguerite uh, for the last session, and of course, yeah. to all the presenters of the last session. So, now let's go to the final session of the day, technical session B. Um, perhaps we can already, already put some slides up for technical session B. Let me just introduce my co-moderator for this session. It's Peter Orban, Professor Peter Orban of the IKA Institute at the RWTH University of Aachen. Uh, Peter is also the leader of Cluster 3 uh, on safety and validation of the CCAM partnership. Uh, so yeah, this session is uh, focusing, this, this session that we're going to start now, is focusing on all aspects of inclusivity, user acceptance, safety, HMI, human factors, life on board, etc. Uh, so it promises to be very interesting. We have uh, some distinguished experts from Faresia, Autolive, TomTom, Tom, Denso, and Continental that will speak in this session. Um, so without further ado, I suggest we go directly to uh, the presentation of Anna Rossi. Anna is the Director of Technology Partnerships at Ferrisia, uh, and she's also the Chairperson of the CLEPA Research and Innovation Working Group. So please, let's go to Anna's presentation, and I hand over to Anna for your presentation on solutions for a connected, personalized, and predictive cockpit. Yeah, David, thanks for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me correctly? Yes, we can. Yes, and uh, I don't see my slides on the other hand. Okay, show my screen. Can you see my slides? We can see your slides, they're not in presentation mode, but we can see them, yes. Okay, that's uh, welcome. Okay, so again, thanks for the introduction, David, and uh, what I would like to share with you today is uh, uh, for SEA position and for SEA strategy uh, on to, for solution for a connected and personalized and predictive cockpit. So, uh, as we progress in autonomous vehicle technology, uh, we do have the ambition uh, to create a full customer experience uh, with the passenger that will feel better at the end of the journey uh, with respect when we start uh, the journey. And this, uh, we decline, uh, this strategy is being declined on two axes. The first one is a smart comfort. Uh, where we uh, have the objective to enhance the customer activity with uh, uh, smart comfort feature and uh, wellness uh, systems. Uh, the second axe is advanced safety, uh, where understanding in vehicle activity is uh, really the key to launch uh, safety action that uh, uh, depending on the context. And as uh, it's uh, easy to understand uh, and uh, uh, in future vehicle uh, we will have a very large variety of use case and user experience uh, that will be need to address uh, here in the slide you see just uh, a few examples of 
for example, advanced safety and answer comfort. But uh, if we also want to make sure that the future vehicle will be uh, also inclusive, inclusive uh, in addition to that, we will have even more use case. So what's the challenge there? The challenge is that uh, uh, we need to have a clear view and a clear understanding of what is happening inside the vehicle. And uh, based on this uh, understanding of what is happening inside the vehicle, we need to be able to offer the right feature in the right context. Why in the right context? Because uh, this needs to be linked uh, with the external context uh, of the vehicle. Uh, the forex approach is uh, is based on uh, on a closed loop approach uh, based on the, what we call sense think and act uh, on the sense in fact uh, we make use of biometry sensors uh, integrated seat sensor why do i mention this because the seat is a real um, it's a, it's a real opportunity because uh, the passenger is always linked to the seat, so we can easily integrate seat, uh, sensors inside this, uh, the, the, the seat and in vehicle camera. Uh, the thing, it's a, a mixture and uh, an assembly of uh, uh, data and sensor fusion strategies linked with artificial intelligence and ACT. Uh, what we uh, do is to use uh, um, in uh, interior feature to stimulate and to offer action that are based on the on the five sense. I'd like to spend a little bit of time on the sensing part because it's really critical. Uh, as I saw in the last presentation that there was a lot of discussion about sensors for the external of the vehicle, very similar situation is uh, for the interior of the vehicle. Uh, and on the sensor side, we need to have a, a top-down approach. Uh, and uh, this top-down approach, first of all, uh, there is the UX domain that we need to address. So are we speaking about wellness? Are we speaking about safety? Are we speaking about HMI? And for example, if we're speaking uh, uh, about wellness, uh, we will need to, will be interested to have information about the pastoral comfort or the thermal comfort of, uh, to know if the person has a motion sickness. On the other hand, if we are speaking about safety, uh, other parameters will be key like uh, for example, the person is out of position or is distracted or is doing some mind wandering and so on. The second pillar on this is uh, uh, once we, we need to really have a clear vision of uh, what are the attributes we, we want to measure. Uh, and again, depending on the UX domain we are looking at, uh, we will uh, uh, look at different biometrics. For example, for wellness, uh, it will be important to have information about the heart rate and uh, or the temperature and the humidity of the, of the person. Uh, but for the safety, we will also look at uh, other things like eye tracking and blinking hunting. So we need to really link the sensor, the right sensor technologies to the uh, measured uh, attributes that you want to measure. And on these two things are very important. First of all, that you don't want to multiply uh, the number of sensors. So we need to have a, a strategy where the same sensor will measure the same thing. Uh, so uh, we want to optimize the number of sensors, uh, but on the same time, we need to uh, allow some redundance uh, so that uh, the large number of use case is addressed. So that's a compromise uh, that needs to be linked with con uh, contextual information uh, about the vehicle. So for example, uh, information about the traffic, uh, the speed of the vehicle, uh, and so on. Uh, the, at this point, uh, the uh, the next step uh, would be to propose a strategy, uh, an action strategy where we would, pro uh, we would uh, propose feature. Uh, so our strategy today is really to leverage on, uh, on the interior vehicle components 
And here you see some example of a feature that we may use, for example, for uh, energize the driver of, or, or alert him, or even uh, uh, giving some massage. Again, depending on if we are looking at uh, uh, wellness or we are looking at uh, safety. Uh, so uh, this, uh, the, 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 the real uh, thinking part will be some artificial intelligence and uh, uh, also recognition of partners uh, and that uh, that will uh, link uh, the right strategy to the right uh, uh, to the right uh, uh, sensing uh, uh, information. So I like to uh, conclude on that uh, because uh, all this, as you can imagine, is uh, pretty complicated. And there are uh, uh, several areas of uh, cooperation that you could uh, that could help accelerate uh, the development of personalized and predictive cockpit. Uh, first of all, as I said at the beginning, uh, at the really at the root is the is the passenger experience uh, on one on the positive side and on the negative side. Uh, especially addressing pay points is uh, particularly important. The second part is really the effectiveness of sensors and the management of sensors uh, with a top-down approach and so it's basically research on sensors and also uh, how you manage uh, the, the interaction between sensors and the third one is also uh, the way how you activate and uh, how you propose things uh, to the passengers. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'd like to remind that uh, there are special requirements and use cases that are related to inclusiveness and these also require uh, some additional investigation and uh, it's, a, it's a perfect use case for international cooperation. And with this I have finished. Uh, okay, so thank you very much Anna for this really interesting presentation it's a very nice concept um, this idea that the occupants of the vehicle will feel better at the end of the journey uh, with respect to the start of the journey um, and it seems like Fares is really trying to develop this new approach going from a technocentric perspective to one which is really looking at the users and the human centric um, aspect um, can you confirm this and also can you also give us some some more idea very briefly about what the main factors are to really drive forward this new approach? Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, I confirm this. I definitely confirm this and uh, it's uh, well, first of all, what I would say it has been uh, an internal recognition. Uh, it's uh, it came from bottom up and top down at the same time. Uh, and uh, this has brought, in fact, two different uh, uh, initiatives uh, within Foresia. That's uh, one side uh, we have implemented, uh, uh, we started to implement system solutions that are based on uh, uh, the generated, uh, based on uh, the understanding and the study of pain points. Uh, we do have a special division that looks at that and then interface with, uh, with a different for a division of Foresia. Uh, the second thing that has been key and uh, is being implemented since uh, a few years is the fact that uh, we have reviewed completely our innovation process and now we do have in our innovation process uh, uh, clear deliverables of at all stages of maturity of uh, our innovation uh, our innovations uh, clear deliverables on the on the user aspect, so related to design, uh, to user experience, to usability, to uh, validation of key pain points, and so on. Uh, and uh, fourth axis is uh, is uh, research and development of expertise uh, that are outside the hard uh, science, are more soft or in cognitive science, and this, of course, we do it through our collaborative uh, ecosystem and uh, through internal expert expertise. Okay, thank you very much indeed again, Anna. As, as Gering was saying before, if uh, 
if we could see if all the 150 people that are still present were, were there, we'd all be clapping. So thank you very much indeed for that. Okay, thank you. So now, so now I'm going to hand over to, to Peter to introduce the second speaker in this session. Yes, indeed. Um, and as Anna has already mentioned in her talk, indeed, protective safety is an issue that we have to have a look into, as pressures will occur also in, in future with automated vehicles. And this issue of protective safety is something that Alexander Gulde will dive into a little bit deeper now in his speech. Alexander Gulde is Senior Director of Engineering at Autoliv. Um, you probably know that Autoliv has been a pioneer in protective safety systems in, in Sweden. But I think you are actually uh, talking from the unique area today, Alexander. Yes, you're right. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me and uh, see my presentation. Yes, Hello? I can. Okay, perfect. So, um, thanks as well for the sp uh, speak before, because this is somehow, uh, I would say, a transition to my presentation. Um, protecting occupants in automated vehicles. And this is always a big question for us, and um, therefore the first sentence, uh, which I have uh, from time to time, not every morning, in my mind is when all the vehicles are automated, do we still need passive safety yeah. and occupant protection? Maybe I have to search for another position or another other business. And um, I come to this conclusion. Oh yes, we need even more. Yeah? And um, I have several reasons or challenges uh, which is explaining in this presentation why we think we need even more. So first of all, there is a, a big pressure, I would say, from the community, from the society, or expectation, not pressure, let's say expectation. There are several um, goals, uh, 17 here from the United Nations, uh, called uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, the number three, the green one, which is highlighted here on the right side, is clearly looking on uh, good health and well-being. Yeah? And despite uh, vaccination or, or other stuff, there is one chapter um, which is going into the, the traffic uh, safety and um, it was broken down yeah, from an um, expert group uh, last year and um, there was a reduction of 50% given as a target for deaths and injuries from road traffic accidents by 2030, which is a very ambitious goal. And uh, this is one of the drivers that I don't see. We have a reduction of safety content in the cars in the future. There's a second uh, challenge which will hit us uh, as well. Not all the cars in the future will be uh, yeah, able to drive uh, in, in this way. Yeah? When I look and I have to cite here McKinsey, yeah, um, and this is a, a study which they have um, uh, done 2020. And you see that uh, even when I include level three highway, highway pilots here on, on this side, uh, not more than 8% uh, of sales in the year 2030 will be level four or higher, yeah, which is not uh, popping up at all. Um, what does it mean? Yeah, uh, that means the avoidance is, is not possible 100%. And as well, still the remaining 36% of sales will be lower than level two, which is, um, uh, I would say, uh, the situation of today, or even, even less partly. Then we have another challenge, and this challenge is caused by um, that we have, yeah, I would say, a lot of different users on the road. And uh, beside the fact, having the 50% target in mind um, to reduce in the car, um, there is an even higher need to protect the weak ones, yeah, the vulnerable road users outside. And this becomes key. You will see different stress scenarios in the future based on the fact that uh, a computer maybe decides differently to a human, uh, or definitely, uh, not, not maybe. And we will have as well a different way of um, uh, motorized uh, two-wheelers in, in, in the market, as well with higher velocities. Challenges, uh, challenges from uh, interiors, and um, this is somehow the link to the, the previous presentation. Um, recline seating, seat position, doing something else than driving, this is a challenge. And so there are multiple possibilities and we have to know what is happening in the car. This was a very good uh, comment. But what is sure, if, if you have a, a, a reclined position yeah, or if you want to sleep or yeah, at least rest, there's a higher risk of uh, submarining. It means that you have not the best protection in the pelvis area during a crash. 
there's a higher load, yeah, because uh, physics is a little bit, or the, the forces are applying a little bit different to the to the body. And there's a, a, a very high need to validate our dummies and human body models to the real uh, situation. Uh, currently, the dummies which we take for the real tests are a little bit too far away uh, because they have been designed in a standard uh, environment of 25 degrees of uh, reclined seating, for example. Then, and this is for me the most important one, to be honest, trust and acceptance. Yeah? And if you ask yourself the question, have I, have I been able to sleep in the car when the capability of the driver was unknown to me? For sure, you can say as well, I have not able, uh, been able to sleep because I was aware of the capability of the driver, which was poor, uh, as well, maybe one of the, the reasons uh, not to do. So we, the trust in, in the safety and reliability of our solutions is a dominant factor. If you want to have a high, um, I, I would say, um, uh, penetration of this uh, kind of cars in, in the market, this is a must. Yeah? And uh, we should not uh, go in, in this direction and say, oh, uh, we, we lower uh, the overall, I would say, personal um, uh, safety. For sure, in, in average, it will improve because mitigation will improve the situation. But the personal risk in some cases are high if we lower the content. And there's another uh, factor, which is the physical limits, yeah? is really a full avoidance possible. And um, I do not mean this, uh, you are under, you are hit by the tree directly, but if this happens in front of you, or if the rock is falling in front of you, or if this accident with the truck where he uh, has uh, lost his load uh, uh, is happening just in front of you, you cannot stop the best physics behind and brakes and everything. And there's as well, as we have heard uh, several days today, 100% um, efficiency of the systems, it's not there so far. So we need as well due to the different factors to protect people for such events. And uh, to the two days cars, they do it on, on a high level. Yeah? And uh, we should not deteriorate this, um, this level of protection. So, and then we have the challenge of how to make it in the car finally. Yeah? Um, we have a kind of uh, system called centric, a seat centric restraint system. You see it here on the left side. Um, where a potential SOP from our point of view is possible by end of 2024, not, not so far. Um, this is much less dependent on the vehicle interior design. That means uh, you need no IP where you have to put a passenger airbag inside. Yeah? If the steering wheel is far away, it works as well. Um, seat integrated belts and airbags is mandatory for su such a system. And uh, we see as well a much higher degree of integration uh, in case of front and side airbag protection because it's the same system. So it's more complex, but it's uh, independent of different position. And um, it's really interesting as well to see that um, it, it works in, in, on a high level. For sure, all the positions are not possible to test in crash tests and uh, the amount of crash tests will raise. So therefore we see a high, high need of um, uh, improving our capabilities on simulation and to have uh, the complete field, which can happen in the car, simulated. Yeah? Therefore, we need a clear direction in our standardization how to do it. Outside of the car, it looks similar. Yeah? For um, um, external bags or protection, hood lifters, whatever, um, is really needed. And uh, these cars will drive in areas later on where you have this, uh, where, where you see a need. And there are three possibilities. Yeah, you protect the cars better, you protect the two wheelers better. Yeah, this is in, integrated in the two wheeler, or you protect the, the people better. Yeah, so there are different uh, possibilities. So, my conclusion is, or our conclusion is, we need definitely to raise the passive safety level because to fully take advantage of the possibilities of these cars. And um, I do not only think about uh, robot taxis and stuff like this, the normal car and then the desire to, to do something else in the car. Then trust, as mentioned before, to accelerate customer acceptance and uh, widespread the deployment of these vehicles. And uh, as I said before, some of these uh, cars will interact a lot with, uh, with pedestrians, uh, two wheelers and so on, and they have to be protected uh, in, a, in a very good way. And finally, for sure, and we strive still towards zero. So this means the content has to go up. So. So let's think about if we do adopting the right type of policies and requirements for this kind of vehicles. Thank you. 
Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much, Alexander, for the nice explanation that in spite of the high potential that automated driving will offer in future to increase road safety, mm -hmm. we will not be able to do without protective systems. So um, do you think that enhanced protective safety is even a kind of kind of prerequisite for higher automation and maybe even for new vehicle types? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say yes and no. It's not so easy to say yes uh, or yes or no. Um, yes and no is, is the answer. If you look in, inside a car um, and if you stay, I would say, in a con conventional arrangement and uh, if you forget for five minutes the 50, minus 50% 50 target, then we can keep the level as today because the people are good protected in the car. And we see it in the accident research that uh, year by year we reduce uh, accidents and, and uh, as, as well we improve the situation but outside of the car it looks differently so this means um, this is something which is not helping us to reduce the 50 percent so focus is outside of the car and we have still some hard um, i would say areas outside of the car which have to be protected in case of accidents and therefore this is, is a must to improve yeah. okay yeah thank you very much again and, thank you um, I would also like to remind all our uh, participants here to, to use the chat function um, for any questions that you may have for our speakers. Uh, it would be nice if we could come back to that in the final discussion. But uh, thank yeah, you. thanks again. So thank you also on my side to Alexander for the very interesting presentation. And we come now to another Alexander, Alexander Kriller. Uh, Manager of Research and Innovation at TomTom. Tom. Um, so, Alexander, yes, over to your presentation towards socially optimized traffic, smart routing, and driver expectations. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. I hope that you can see my screen um, and you can hear me speaking. Yes, can. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, glad to be here. Thanks for his invitation. Um, I'm representing TomTom Tom today and I want to quickly point to a few things. Um, that you are probably aware of before diving deeply into this. So if you look at um, uh, what we as a company are, are proposing and what pretty much all other companies in mobility are currently talking about is a future where traffic flows freely and accidents don't happen anymore, right? And a lot of the presentations that we saw already fall into one or another part of that vision. Um, emissions are gone, suddenly we have fresh air, everything's electric, cities are green, Cities are quiet, everybody's happy, right? So that's the kind of future that we're talking about. And of course, um, uh, this is a future vision. It's also something we believe can actually happen. And so if you look at our vision uh, from the company I work for, that's TomTom, Tom, we say that we believe in a future with three things, safer roads, free of congestion, free of emission, right? And if you look at these three um, aspects, these are ultimately societal needs, and these societal needs also play a role in how we define CCAM, right? Um, what you probably expect, and I need to just quickly mention it, is of course, uh, I think everybody who's attending this conference knows that TomTom Tom is powering all levels of automated driving. We are having an ADAS map product in the market that powers anything up to level two autonomy. And for higher levels of autonomy, we are marketing um, an HD map. You probably know that um, we already had several presentations that dove into different parts of map making that would skip that for today and instead focus on something else, which is socially optimized routes, which is a very complicated term um, that, however, um, has a couple of consequences for CCAM actually, right? And what we're talking about here is essentially the vision of um, if everybody is in autonomous vehicles and they, they don't have to drive anymore, um, why not take a bit more control over where they are driving, right? And that is, if you look at um, uh, discussions happening, especially with road authorities, um, with traffic management centers, a view that, that they very often can't wait to happen, right? So cities are congested, highways are congested, somehow we need to um, deal with the problem. There's just too much traffic for just not enough concrete. And um, load balancing is one of uh, the potential solutions to that, right? So um, we've been uh, in, in a couple of projects in the past where we also work with road authorities and that is a core part of what they um, would like to see. 
you might also be aware that there's a Horizon Europe call coming up, I think, uh, end of this year, early next year, around the integration of CCAM with, um, with traffic management or future forms of traffic management. And that's something I would like to talk about. So if you if you consider what that is, load balance routing, right? So that is ultimately that uh, we are not only taking the direct environment of the driver into or the vehicle into account, but actually the entire traffic uh, network. And what we are offering to to um, whoever that is could be a driver, could be a passenger in a fully automated um, robot taxi, is essentially a trade. And whenever we're offering a trade, we need to keep in mind that that person is probably a paying customer. Right. It could be that uh, they paid for the trip and it's in a robo taxi, they paid for a monthly fee and it's in public transport, or they paid a six figure amount of money for an exclusive autonomous vehicle with all the bells and whistles. Right? Doesn't matter. It's a customer and a customer has choices. The trade we're offering them in any form of load balancing and any form of route optimization is essentially would you be willing to take a little bit of extra travel time, right? We would like to make your, your trip two minutes longer or five minutes or one or whatever it is. Or maybe we want to drop you off at the park and ride station so that you can take public transport, right? So we're asking you to give something up. And in return, what we promise to do is we can have less congestion in the city. Uh, we can have less pollution in the place where you live or we can produce less noise in quiet neighborhoods that you might actually not want to disturb, right? That's a fundamental trade that is underlying all traffic management um, schemes. And we've been experimenting with that. We um, have a project running, a NIA project uh, called Zucotis 2.0, um, and we're now continuing this kind of work into EIT or mobility projects called um, Future Digital Mobility Management and AI Travel. And they're all trying to explore this, this trade-off. And we really want to understand how the trade-off works. Um, we're not trying to nudge the driver in any, any direction. It's really about figuring out first, what is the space there? And will that be something that uh, will improve or not improve um, services, including everything CCAM? And I would like to share three insights with you that I found quite interesting, and maybe you find them interesting too. First insight is um, a bit surprising, they love it. Right. Plain and simple. Um, we ask them, uh, ask a lot of drivers about uh, whether they would like to see this kind of thing coming up on their screen, and they appreciate it. On a scale of 1 to 10, they say it's an 8.1. That's fantastic. Um, we computed a net promoter score, so a product um, quality measure or value measure, and it's plus 35. Fantastic. Right? So um, it's really something that might happen, and it's a good idea because it puts us in a situation where the environment really benefits, the driver is happy about it, we can offer, uh, we can offer uh, innovative solutions. It's really a nice, nice place to be. Of course, whether or not they would take that offer, that's a different question. And that is a um, little bit more, it's a little bit more careful consideration. Of course, they would easily take an offer that gives them also a personal benefit, like not standing in a, a stop and go situation is more important than the environment and the pollution, which is a bit of a more abstract notion for many people. But the positive uh, sentiment is there. Second insight that I would like to talk about is we also played with um, or worked with who is actually providing this advice, right? So we provided drivers and, and um, participants in the study with all kinds of people who, who come up with route advice, right? So in this example here, it's transport for London, because why not, right? So maybe they have a great idea to get you on an eight minutes lower trip um, because that contributes to jam prevention somewhere. Would you do that? Would you not do that? Is that influenced if it's not transport for London, but Tong Tong or anybody else? And um, there we found that trust plays a major role and that's going to be something that we need to really be careful about. So ultimately there were some examples where where the participants trust Tomto -tom more than a traffic authority, and they were mostly those that were about um, traffic prediction and the exact um, understanding of the traffic situation, where people see us as an authority. But overall, actually, the, the, the willingness to participate was even a bit higher when it came from a uh, traffic authority, because people trust these authorities, and they know they are working actually in their favor. 
right? That's their their job. Um, so that's good. It's something we can leverage on, right? So there's trust there to give people something that they like, and it's a good idea to do it. But of course, trust can also be very easily ruined and very hard earned. And what we found is that as soon as you bring in incentives, as soon as you tell people, take the route and I give you 10 cents for it, it shifts, it works. People take the 10 cents, they like it, and they take the, take the detour. But there's a high chance that they start mistrusting the entire system, right? So if I'm getting paid for this, it must be something bad. Why am I doing it? Um, so we need to take into account this trust is hard earned, can easily be, be um, uh, destroyed. And we also find out that the story about just influencing traffic and pushing routes into cars and controlling where the drives, uh, where the cars are going, that's not acceptable, right? Across the board, in all the studies, people are not willing to take have anybody automatically just route without them being in control. And that is a safe way to to immediately kill any trust if that happens automatically. That's an easy way to get to a point where you. Um, uh, we get to a point where you are actually incentivizing or creating a differentiating feature by not doing the service. So that's something we should just not accept and probably will not. And third insight is um, we're not there yet. We played this through with a couple of traffic authorities, including a, um, a Dutch one that we see here, um, try to figure out how much effect would it actually have, can it really change traffic. And in the current situation, our experiment was rather low. So realistic scenarios about one and a half percent of the trips that uh, we wanted to affect would actually get this intervention. Um, if you look at the entire study that we had with Grand several months, it's only it's way less than a percent that um, we could potentially shift, which is not going to have any impact on traffic. So inside here is we have to wait maybe a bit more until this becomes more mature. But if that happens, it is a nice situation where really everybody wins and I'm I'm really positive that at some point in time, we will really can be able to use that to reduce traffic and get rid of all the congestion in our cities. Thank you. Oh, we even have a thank you slide. Okay, thank you very much, Alexander. Um, very interesting presentation. Can I ask you a very quick question? Um, so, you know, we were saying before about how important user acceptance is in all of this discussion about CCAM and about market penetration. Can I just ask you, how would you expect user acceptance to change when the driver is not in control of the vehicle, particularly, for example, when going along at high speed along a, a motorway? Uh, do you have any insight you can provide us with, with on that? So we, I don't have hard data, right? So I can only um, guess to a certain degree here. But I would assume it's not changing so much, right? And the insight simply comes from the fact that the trade, the fundamental trade, gives some time to get something in return. That is still there. That's not changed. Um, it might shift a bit in individual use case. It is about congestion. Is it about pollution? Is it about noise? That of course. Right. And you can you can easily see that by the way already, right? So just take a high speed train in Germany, um, where you um, also have absolutely no control where that is going. It's super convenient, but if that train is five minutes late, people get angry, right? So that trade is not changing just because um, you're not driving the car. I think so, but of course we have to observe it um, more closely when it happens. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you. So let's now go to the fourth presentation uh, in this session, the fourth, the penultimate, and I'll hand over again to Peter to introduce the speaker. Yes, and I think here we are looking again at the fundamental technologies that we need and uh, have to use in the future for automated driving. In particular, the issue of security will be in the focus of the speech that Tim Leinmiller will present to us. Um, Tim is working at the Head of Fundamental Technology R&D um, Department at Denso. Thank you very much, Peter, for the kind introduction. So I hope you can hear me and you can also see my presentation now. All right. Yes, you can. Okay, then here we go. So um, thank you very much for also for the invitation and for being able 
to join this workshop. And um, when I talk about CCAM, I always like to start with um, this picture that I've been using um, several times because it very nicely reflects a lot of uh, what we heard today in the different presentation and contributions um, in, in this workshop today, because um, in the end, it shows that um, vehicles and mobility in CCAM is really part of a, a bigger and larger system and uh, it interacts with all uh, what is around the vehicle, what are other traffic participants, but it also has a fundamental influence on um, how vehicles will, will look in future and also how um, the vehicles internally will change and how inside out and outside in um, the vehicles are um, integrated into an overall um, CCAM system. Um, uh, Complementing some of the discussion topics that we have today, um, I'm going to go through different topics. Um, one of them uh, being security and um, apart from the technological challenges I, that we are facing, also I think most importantly and maybe most crucially we are facing uh, quite some challenges in terms of um, how we are going to do security engineering for CCAM. And that is um, for several reasons. Um, one of them being that um, with CCAM, we are more and more integrating um, security engineering across different industries. So obviously we have the um, automotive or vehicle industry. We also interact in what we've been doing so far with um, the production industry, as well as we do with the component and IC industry. But even further than that, we also do integrate and interact with um, service providers and also um, the roadside, the roads and the roadside equipment vendors. And that is um, one of the reasons why we need to look into what there is as different security engineering standards. And also we need to do and work and continue working on integrating them and making them um, interact with each other. On another level, um, we also see that um, the engineering processes and security engineering process in the supply chain have to adapt accordingly because um, with CCAM systems, the complexity of our systems is increasing um, dramatically and uh, therefore we are applying a lot of level-based engineering approaches, which is also then a need for security, especially when we think about uh, making the security engineering traceable and also measurable and making our verification in, in those systems. Specifically, then, when we think about those systems being developed by different um, uh, actors and um, suppliers in, in such a system, then one of the challenges is obviously also how do we define interfaces between those different um, engineering and um, uh, component groups, um, which is one topic that we are also specifically looking into a um, research project, um, which is called Tech for Car Safe. And uh, not only addressing the, um, the engineering challenges in security on uh, one level, but also in, uh, into, uh, addressing the challenges on an international level, uh, taking into account what happens if such an uh, engineering project is distributed across different um, continents and different companies. And last but not least, kind of like the third dimension for um, the challenges and um, yeah, enabling factors that we need in security engineering is that um, with CCAN even more than, than today, we uh, anticipate all of this being um, distributed globally. And I think that is a, a quite significant challenge for all um, our parties or all parties involved because um, we see obviously that there are different markets in the world with different requirements and also different regulations. Still, um, uh, as industries, we're trying to produce global systems that are then tailored to the local markets. So we also need to have the possibility to collaborate globally, which um, also in the past has been a, uh, a considerable challenge in especially the security domain. Uh, one very um, well, visible effect that we, we've seen in that was for instance, when we talk about um, the sharing of vulnerabilities of systems that we have in the market, where we um, have started overcoming the hurdles, but still need to spend more efforts in um, coming to agreements and uh, in the end set up systems that help us 
uh, doing that. Um, I think one, one example um, that uh, we as an industry have already started is the order Isaac um, uh, uh, community, where we have started uh, providing that kind of a platform to um, enable that um, global information sharing and collaboration. Uh, another um, enabling domain that I've um, brought for, for today's presentation is um, uh, looking into the um, CCAM design process. And um, in the end, the way how our product design process is evolving when we uh, talk about um, from what we have today uh, towards uh, fully um, uh, connected, cooperative and uh, automated mobility. So. Um, as of today, um, I think this is quite uh, an example and very well known. We are working a lot in, in virtual design process for our products, but already for um, um, the initial higher automation levels and first automated driving systems, um, I think this is uh, very well understood and has been shown in many, many projects. Um, this is not uh, enough anymore because it's not feasible to um, assure the safety of an automated driving system only with the um, classical um, validation processes where you drive a certain number of kilometers and in the end you can conclude that the such a system is then um, uh, safe enough to be put on the market. And um, this was one um, aspect that was looked into as part of the Enable S3 project uh, where um, the key outcome was that um, in the end getting those systems into the market is uh, feasible through using digital engineering processes. So uh, from there, um, to get to really CCAM, um, <clears throat> we think there needs to be a further evolution from this uh, digital engineering to um, a, a database uh, design, where in the end, um, the um, system are not um, designed, engineered at one point in time and then put into the market, but really does that uh, process evolves into a continuous uh, uh, system engineering process where um, the systems are improved consistent uh, continuously over um, the lifetime by using um, the data collected and uh, obtained through and during the operation, which also means that in the end, it will never be a static system anymore, but a continuously evolving and improving system. And um, this is something um, we are looking into as part of, uh, for instance, the um, Pozzetta project, uh, which is a project that recently started um, uh, uh, as a research project. Another area I wanted to bring into um, the discussion today is the um, area of in-vehicle networks. And um, I think also in, was it in the first session today, we already touched upon that. Um, that we see a considerable evolution and changes in um, those in the networks, um, resulting in um, uh, consolidation of functions uh, that previously used to be uh, implemented in dedicated ECUs now being uh, uh, carried out by uh, integrated um, systems or in bigger ECUs. And um, specifically for the in-vehicle networks, the resulting um, challenge is that um, they become much more dynamic as they used to be in the past. In the past, the uh, networks in the vehicles were quite predictable because every unit had a certain function and it was clear uh, what kind of uh, requirements in terms of communication and exchange in the vehicles were resulting from those functions. However, now we are more and more getting um, functions that are dynamic, which means that also the communication requirements in the vehicle are more dynamic. Furthermore, there are, um, in general challenges um, in the in-vehicle networks, such as um, um, adding new applications to the vehicles uh, after the vehicles have been put into the market, fail operation when a certain part of the vehicle fails, or even partial networking and uh, where you shut down parts of the network to save energy. And um, this is uh, something where we are looking into um, in several research activities, um, specifically looking, for instance, into heuristics or AI-based scheduling of this in-vehicle um, communication as part of uh, a research project uh, called uh, KI Pro, which is for um, uh, Artificial Intelligence uh, Pro. 
Last but not least, um, one area that I want to cover, um, which is very much to the name of uh, CCAM, which is um, the connectivity of our vehicles, as well as the, the further evolution. And I think this picture shows here what we are, um, I, I wouldn't say having widely deployed, but we are getting to uh, more and more. So our vehicles um, having sensors on board, communicating with each other, communicating with edge components, and obviously also with cloud components. The interesting aspect of that for me is, however, that we will obviously also see a um, fundamental and considerable evolution of these communication technologies. Currently, with um, the ongoing deployment of 5G technology that will and is providing more and more features and more and more capabilities in terms of communication for our vehicles. But I think even more importantly, with um, the um, stepping stone that we are currently at when looking into what we expect from um, future communication technologies as in the evolution of uh, 5G towards um, 6G, where um, we expect those uh, networks and connectivity features becoming even more powerful and even more supportive for all the different aspects of, um, of CCAM, be it the bare communication with in um, the direct range of the vehicle, but even supporting um, the um, sensing inside and outside of the vehicle and the interaction and direct interaction with um, other road participants. And I think that is something we will um, look into in, in the coming years um, and where we will see really a considerable evolution and considerable add-on support for, um, for CCAM. So with that, I'm at the end of my quick presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Tim, for your presentation. I think it was very interesting to have a look at that important issue of security in, in the context of automated driving. Um, and what I think was very interesting also is uh, that the interplay between the different stakeholders in the end, the different um, domains of vehicle infrastructure and so on. And, even if we think about research issues, as we did in the CCAM partnership, we have a tendency to structure that into weak related issues, infrastructure related issues, and then the idea comes up, oh, well, that is all integrated somehow. So um, how do you think, how will security engineering processes in vehicle development in future integrate with infrastructure and IT backend engineering? Yeah, I, I th thank you very much for that question, Peter. And I think um, you, you started with a, with a good uh, starting point. As, as security is really complex in all those uh, different areas, we need to start by divide and conquer. So that's, I think, also why within the CCAM partnership, we still have divided it in, in the different areas. However, um, um, one, once we have done that division, we also need to think about the interfaces. And that means, um, in future, um, we need to use models for uh, being able to model those interfaces. And also we need to um, think about how we do the integration because uh, clearly speaking, I think um, the security of roads, roadside infrastructure, and also of um, uh, IT systems or um, services that are supporting automated driving will be part and have to be part of the um, security development process of an automated vehicle. So therefore, it doesn't end anymore at the vehicle, but really spans across all those different components that are involved in, in, in the end, enabling and running a uh, connected cooperative and automated vehicle. So. Okay, yeah, indeed, uh, one of the important challenges that I think we are facing in, in future. Thanks for that, Tim. And um, yeah, I think uh, back to David. Yes, thank you. Thank you also to Tim. Uh, very interesting again. Uh, so we come now to the final presentation uh, of the day. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Zach Bolton, Innovation Manager in North America at Continental. And um, Zach's presentation is entitled the human factor in mobility. So over to you, Zach. 
Thank you. Appreciate that. So if we're ready to rock, I think you can see my screen. Yeah, it's all working all right. well. Thank you. So got a background in the mobility space here at Continental for about 17 years, uh, working on everything from mechanical design of gearboxes um, to an ADAS de um, algorithm developer for sensor fusion. So there's a little bit of diversity in what I've done, but at the same time, I think a little bit of diversity in where I come from. So part of this whole human factor in mobility stems from a global perspective. And every one of us has unique requirements um, when, for mobility solutions. And without a doubt, at the top of all of our minds should be safety, um, design, especially for fit and function, and inclusion of our lo loved ones. So you can see here, my parents, they're, they're a bit older, right? They've got a different generational expectation of what mobility is, but m my daughters um, also have a different expectation. And lastly, though, we can't forget, especially here in America, uh, pets, right? So we bring our dogs along um, on our trips, and those all need to be factored in uh, when we talk about design, safety, and inclusion. And uh, I guess there's a, a couple of things, especially with the U.S. market, that come to mind. Here in North America, we, we tend to favor big trucks that we can pull our camper trailers with, our boats with. As you saw the picture of me and the daughter Dorothy there on the, on the beach, we like our water life. Uh, we also like to take our vehicles off road. And with that comes the need for some safety technology to help enable us to drive our bigger vehicles here in North America or US. Um, and what I'm showing is a couple examples of how we can handle that um, from the safety perspective of seeing what you can't normally see. Everything from a translucent A-pillar with that virtual A-pillar to a transparent hood or center screen where you can see what that um, Range Rover is driving over as we're traversing some really yeah, diverse terrain, um, all contributing to a happier state of mobility. Um, the other side of safety is kind of understanding how to put things in context for everybody. So not highlighting everything on a screen when you have a, a chance to do it with heads up display, but highlighting maybe what the driver or the controller um, didn't recognize. So maybe they've, they've got some trouble with navigation in a big urban environment, really helping them understand which lane, um, speed limit recognition, things that they might have missed, that's what we really want to make sure we're bringing to the forefront when we're talking about uh, heads-up display technology. And lastly, um, and kind of bridging the gap between the safety side and the design for fit and function is the, the 3D element of things. And we're seeing, in, especially in our bigger vehicles in the US, I mean, we have a, a three-row SUV in our family um, there's display screens all over, and we don't want to forget about our uh, passengers in different areas um, and ex enjoying what's on those screens. And so here's a little um, video about what we've done at Continental um, to help with that immersive experience with um, both a 3D physical touch surface, so you can find your buttons Find your slider knobs much easier because you actually have landing pads for your fingers, but also a glasses list 3D display that basically is allowing anybody from any angle of the vehicle to be immersed in whatever content you have there, whether it's navigation or maybe your, your daughter's favorite Disney movie. And um, like I mentioned before, safety is still paramount and we still have drivers making decisions or, or controlling the vehicle. So making sure that there's some sort of asset in the vehicle that they can control to, whether it's a landing pad for their fingers, um, is something that's very valuable. Now, when we move into what the future of our vehicles should look like, I think it's important to realize not only will we change the seating positions, and uh, I think it was really cool to see some of those seat-centric passive safety systems we saw from Audi Leaf, but we also will change how our speakers um, might look and sound or at least look, the, the technology here is, is what we call the actuated sound. It's basically using actuators 
thumping on panels that already exist inside our vehicles. So now you no longer need to have speaker space compartments. It's essentially integrated right into the body panels of the interior of your vehicle. But you also don't have to worry about, not ugly, but those maybe less than design perfect speaker grills that you have everywhere. So this is also something at Continental we see as a, a huge benefit to give freedom um, to the designers. Now inclusion um, is a tricky one for us in human factors and human machine interface. And I challenge anyone out there to say that their, their products are all inclusive. We're just not built that way in the mobility industry. We design products to sell to a mass market and we design them for the 90% of that bell curve to fit well. One area at least Continental is trying to push that envelope is in our recognition of um, faces and occupants inside our vehicle. And the way we're working on this is actually synthetic data generation. So we have endless permutations. We can do different skin tones. We can do different eye shapes and facial structures that would be beyond any of our own data classes that we would ever be able to train to or any company would ever be able to train to with real physical data. And I think that's important when we talk about inclusion because we don't want to be recognizing certain features and classifying them as inhuman. That'd be really tragic, I think. And so that's one area I think we've got to do a great job in the human machine interface and inclusion in Continental and the rest of the world. Uh, of companies, and I think that's one way we're we're really working on it. Um, another area that was just mentioned in that last presentation was a little bit on the infrastructure side, and that's my bread and butter. I'm a runner, I'm a cyclist, uh, and so therefore I am a vulnerable road user. I'm less massive than these big F-150, F-350 diesel pickup trucks that are driving down the roadway. So because I'm a vulnerable road user, it doesn't make me any less of a human, less of a participant in this ecosystem. And here at Continental, we're doing something really great. Um, instead of both dividing and conquering infrastructure and um, mobility automotive components, we've actually brought both together. Um, at Continental, we make cameras and radars see the road around our car. We now are making cameras and radars seeing the intersections down below us. And that's what we call intelligent infrastructure. And that's what we believe will help bridge the gap between um, yeah, these safety systems for connected automated mobility, because we, we can drive up critical mass of connected points uh, much quicker that way. So uh, really quick, I tried to um, go through a few areas where we address the human factors, the human machine interface, um, in various areas of safety and inclusion um, at Continental. So um, I'll open it up for some questions. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Zach. Very interesting. Certainly these questions looking at inclusion and the border with almost ethical issues as well is certainly very relevant to this discussion. So thank you very much for introducing that. So I just have one quick question for you. Again, similar to the question I asked uh, previously, you know, as you as the as vehicles, automated vehicles, uh, connected automated driving, um, the market is penetrated by these new vehicles. How do you expect user acceptance to change? Do you think it's going to accelerate? You know, what are the obstacles there, and how do you think these obstacles may be overcome through technological development? Zach, are you there? Yeah, I think the one of the largest obstacles that we're seeing is the connected vehicles to really make a huge difference. And that's troubling a lot of us when we're trying to buy into these systems. And that's where that last slide about the intelligent infrastructure at Continental. Really comes in driving up the critical mass of who's using and who's benefiting from it without having both those pieces simultaneously. So cars that are connected, but also your infrastructure that speaks out on behalf of vulnerable road users and old cars like my dad's 1941 Cadillac there, that's not going to get connected. So we've got to be the voice of those as well to make this uh, really work. 
Okay, many thanks indeed for that. Yeah, so thank you very much. I see the clock is ticking now, so we, we should really enter into the final panel discussion quickly. Um, and so for that, I'm going to pass over again to Peter. Peter, would, do you have a question or two that you would like to ask our, our panelists? Yes, of course. Um, I hope that all panelists are, are here and able to, to answer right now. Um, well, I think we have heard about a lot of challenges that are still there and that we have to overcome in order to uh, make higher levels of automation, highly automated driving in particular, a reality on our roads. Um, in addition to, to all what we've heard already, um, is there any particular challenge that you think we have not discussed about or maybe not discussed about intensively enough? Maybe also a little bit aside from, from your particular um, field of, of experience and your presentation. If your answer is no, then of course I have another question. I have a very general one. I'm wondering about uh, this back coupling effect of the um, uh, road users, especially pedestrians, if they if they know that the car will break. So will they make a game out of this uh, situation? Yeah, or um, what is this back coupling? And uh, do we have an answer for this question? Yeah, and uh, if you are used that 80% uh, of the cars will have will break for you and maybe 20 not. Um, will this uh, lead to higher accidents or higher rate of accidents? Yeah, because uh, they cannot really distinguish uh, if you're not a, a, a car fan or whatever. Then uh, maybe this is an open question which is not really answered or, or at least not known, to, not known to me. Yeah, yeah I think that uh, it, it hit the point when I was developing adaptive cruise control systems as well, though, um, or, or autonomous emergency brake assist systems at Continental. There's my neighbor, he he, uh, he hates adaptive cruise control because it it slows down and and it inherently lets other cars cut in front of him, and they continuously cut in front. And we've seen people play games against Tesla vehicles and and try their limits. Um, but I I do believe that as the critical mass for these systems becomes more apparent, um, and we've done some studies about how people react, how pedestrians react, um, and Ford's done great uh, research here too to autonomous vehicles and do they really game them um, and play around with them? And we found that it, it goes away really quick. Uh, there might be a few instances early on in the adoption, we're seeing those now, but that 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 fades really quickly. You don't jump in front of a freight train um, because you want to test its ability to autonomously stop uh, for you. You don't run out on an airport tarmac um, to see if their their autopilot can handle that sort of thing essentially Darwin's rule might take over there too, I don't know. But I, I think overall we're going to see that that's not the, that's not the human nature of us um, with these technologies. Even in the US where we push the limits, we walk when it says don't walk, um, we bike on the wrong side of the roads, we don't wear helmets when we ride a bicycle. I mean, yeah, so if, if we're seeing that in the US, I'd, I'd hope we can kind of see that that happens everywhere else too. Okay, thank you. Hey, any other views from, from the other speakers regarding Alexander's question or, um, or the, the general question on, on new challenges, other challenges that we have not yet discussed today, but that you still think are very relevant or will become more relevant? Maybe one question to also what we previously talked about uh, before is how and if uh, the roads will change or have to change um, when we move further towards automation. So, um, that's, is there a need for like a physical separation of pedestrian walks and those roads where automated vehicles are driving, or will the pedestrian walks be gone away anyway, or um, or will automation only be allowed if there is no pedestrian walk? So I, I think that is also quite interesting aspect. Yeah, and indeed. I think it is a good point. And there's a lot of work being done with the, the, the passive infrastructure uh, players here, like 3M, who makes a lot of those reflective coatings and reflective strips 
on the roadways and being able to embed machine vision um, capacity to those to give further indication about this is an autonomous area or not. That's one area I think we'll see roadways change. I don't think we'll see separate lanes uh, for autonomous vehicles um, forever. We will see these at early adoption phases, but I, I don't see that being how we solve the problem. Segregation is never the answer. Um, inclusion and designing for inclusion is the answer. And so it's gonna take a lot of great minds like those that are on the panel here um, to keep pushing that envelope and not, not accept segregating uh, certain partitions of roadways, I think, in our cities. They'll get chopped up. Okay. Well, I think we could continue here because uh, these are all relevant questions and uh, maybe we don't know all the answers yet. Um, maybe also an interesting input for, for future research agendas that we are working on in Europe. Um, so we should definitely keep that in mind, but I think for the reasons of, of timing, we uh, have to pass on again to, to David to um, yeah, draw some conclusions from what we have discussed today. So uh, well, from my side, thank you very much again for your presentations and also for answering our questions. Thank you, Peter. Yes, I mean, I'm not going to attempt to to summarize everything that's been talked about today because we've covered so many or touched on so many different points. Uh, very interesting discussions, very interesting presentations. Um, I think what you know, the way we should conclude this is by saying that, uh, you know, this is an open discussion and, and we need to find other opportunities, perhaps organize other workshops such as this to keep this discussion going. Certainly the CCAM partnership will provide a good forum for discussion in Europe, um, but we need to find a way of extending that forum, uh, you know, out to cover a wider, wider region, let's say, become perhaps global, certainly in the spirit of international cooperation. And, you know, we were discussing before about the needs for international standards, and in general, just international cooperation to develop the technologies because, you know, many of these technologies still need to be developed uh, to reach a certain level of maturity before we can even talk about standardization. So let me just conclude by thanking everybody that's intervened today. We've had over 20 people uh, speak uh, today between moderators and presenters and panelists. So thank you, all of you, for for participating so actively and for making this such an interesting workshop. But also thanks to the people working behind the scenes, in particular my colleagues Sonia, Ikram, Kasia and Pilar, working behind the scenes, working behind the screens actually, uh, just to make everything work work well. Um, you, will, as, as we said before, this presentation, this workshop has been recorded. Uh, when we get the final go ahead from all the participants. We will make this recording available via the Arcade website and via Klebaz website. And also uh, you will have access to the presentations that the speakers will, will make available as well. So all the, the, the material should be available. So, you know, you'll receive some information on that in due course. And yes, yeah, once again, thank you all uh, for participating. Let me also just before closing, remind you again of tomorrow's event, the Mobility E, our Lighthouse project, the Cosmos um, uh, final, final event. That is tomorrow, starting tomorrow morning. So if that's of interest to you, I think many of the topics addressed tomorrow will be very relevant with respect to what we discussed today. So again, thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to say goodbye.